True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. It's not clear exactly when Carolyn died. Perhaps she was hanging on while her sons tried to save her life, using techniques she herself had taught them at the local surf lifesaving club. Perhaps she was already gone. What is known for sure is that by the time the police arrived at 6.17, moments before the ambulance crew, blood loss from the nine stab wounds had proven lethal. Carolyn had been home alone for just 20 minutes. The crime scene is as baffling as it is shocking. A suburban housewife brutally stabbed to death in her own home. You wonder why a woman such as Carolyn Matthews had been targeted uh, and had been murdered for no apparent reason. Why? And most importantly, who? What you have is a good suburb with a good family, a good mother, a good wife, and there are a lot of unanswered questions. Police have stepped up patrols in the area, with many residents now too frightened to be home alone. You start thinking to yourself, perhaps there's some uh, crazed person out there wandering around. Uh, if there is, is he going to strike again tonight? If so, where? The immediate thought is, well, who's responsible for this? Uh, why has it happened? Uh, are there any risks to the community? And uh, there's some urgency in finding the answers to those questions. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. Good evening. Whether you're looking for flavor adventure or simply better tasting meals, fill your pantry with Spice Islands. Spice Islands uses a craft approach to capture the volatile oils, which gives flavor to each spice. And whatever your spice may be, Spice Island maintains a strict standard for each item to ensure consistency, quality, and flavor. Now, tonight I made a spicy curry using their spicy curry powder, and I made this curry with mango and chickpeas. It was quite excellent. And I went with my beer of the night, Little Creatures Pale Ale. Paired very well. So remember, visit spiceislands.com forward slash brewery for more spice facts and delicious recipes. And pick up Spice Island spices in the premium spice section of your local retailers. And this episode is also sponsored by Madison Reed, the people who are transforming the way we color our hair. With beautiful, salon-quality, multidimensional hair color delivered to your door on your schedule, this is not your mother's hair color. Join the thousands of women who've fallen in love with Madison Reed and say goodbye to spending hours in the salon. Visit madison-reed.com and get 10% off plus free shipping on your first color with our promo code BREWERY. That's madison-reed.com and promo code BREWERY. Darren Burgess had married the wrong woman. That's an understatement. Clinging to a dying relationship for the sake of his children, he turned to alcohol and you can't blame him. Now, through 1998 and 1999, he drank heavily, just to numb the pain, he said, and he started taking risks. In March of 2000, after a work meeting, he was arrested for drunk driving. Now, he feared he would lose his job in his home, so he went to his boss, Kevin Matthews, for help. Now, Darren ended up keeping his job. His license was suspended for six months. Darren believes that it was during this time period that his wife, Michelle, and his boss began communicating via text messages. Flirtations progressed to a full-on love affair. Now, this wasn't the first time that Michelle had been unfaithful to Darren. She was actually known for her brazen infidelities. And Kevin wasn't exactly husband of the year to his wife, Carolyn. The intensity of their relationship quickly made it public knowledge, but neither Kevin nor Michelle seemed to care. What they did seem to care about was money. When their marriages began to dissolve, their minds turned to murder. 
This episode of True Crime Brewery is about lust, betrayal, greed, and a murder-for-hire scheme that destroyed two families. Come to the quiet end with us for our discussion, Dead by Friday, the murder of Carolyn Matthews. I'm so excited to try today's beer. It's an Aussie beer. Yes, it is. This is Little Creatures Pale Ale, brewed by Little Creatures Brewing Company in Fremantle, Australia. Now, this is an American pale ale, sort of in the same vein as Sierra Nevada pale ale, Dale's pale ale, and one of our own beers in Maine, Peeper. Okay. So, an American pale ale generally shows a balance between malt and hops. They very often can be fruity, at the same time they can have some bitterness to them. The American versions are tending to be hoppier. The British versions tend to be a little maltier. This particular one is a gold-colored beer, very pretty white head that dissipates to just a little layer over the top of the, the beer. It's just got a sweet malt and a floral hop aroma. Taste is more floral and grassy hops, some caramel. Very smooth with a little late hop bitterness. A nice example of the breed. Good. So it's recommended. You bet. Okay. So let's open it up and we'll go down to the quiet end. I got it. Okay, Dickie, let's head on down. Okay, I got a couple bottles of Little Creatures Pale Ale, and I'm bringing some pint glasses again just because it's an APA, and we'll head on down. All right, sounds great. Quiet down here tonight. It's perfect. It is. We got a lot to talk about. Mm-hmm. So let's begin the story. Doug and Yvonne Tidwell, who are the parents of Carolyn Matthews, met at a dance while Doug was in trade school. They got married in 1955 when they were both only 18 years old. A year and a half later, their son Jeffrey was born. Now, Yvonne was pregnant with Carolyn when Jeffrey was five years old. The family had been living in a rental in Camden Park, and it was time to upgrade. Doug was working as a mechanic when he brought home a brochure for a suburban development called Netley. I grew up in a little town in New Jersey called Nutley. I know, yeah. Netley and Nutley. How about that? The neighborhood offered variations of brick homes, and Yvonne liked the colonial model the best. Now, at the time, Netley consisted of only a few small blocks of built-up farmland. The only drawback, though, was its proximity to the airport, so it was pretty noisy. But to Yvonne, this was a small price to pay. Neighborhood filled with young families like themselves, and in the last six months of 1963, nine children got born into the neighborhood. Yeah, now Jeff was really taken with his little sister right away. He called her Miss Muffet, and that name caught on. She was forever known to her family as Missy. In the six years after Carolyn was born, Yvonne had three more sons, Glenn, Peter, and Christopher. So we got five kids in this family. Yes. One little girl. Yep. Surrounded by all those boys. I know. There was a lot for Carolyn to put up with living with these four boys, but she had neighbor girls to play with. She had Kayleen, who lived across the street, and Christine, who lived two doors down. Now, Christine had three brothers of her own to deal with, so they had a lot in common. They could relate to each other. The three girls stuck together through school, doing calisthenics and playing netball. As Carolyn got older, she focused on life-saving. So Surf Life Savings Clubs, or SLSCS, are volunteer institutions at Australia's beaches. The clubs conduct surf life-saving services on weekends and public holidays, and they host many beach sport activities, such as nippers, surf carnivals, and other competitions. Now, the SLSCS are responsible for the education of lifesavers, including operation of inflatable rescue boats, and maintaining radio communication with other beaches and air rescue resources. Nippers are the lifesavers that are between 5 and 14 years old. Yeah, I had to keep uh, looking up things when we were reading the book. Yes, but I love the names that the Australian people have for things like nippers. And There was something in the book about how the mom was pitching a fit and they had this really yeah, I forget. clever little way of saying it. Right. They have some great little sayings. Yeah, they got some good yeah. idioms. Yes. So Christine, who remained Carolyn's friend throughout her life, remembers their childhood as pretty much an ideal childhood. Once a year, their entire street would go to Bel Air Park for a picnic 
where the dads would play tennis as the kids would find adventure in the trees and the caves nearby. And the, the girls, of course, would torment some of the boys, and in particular, Carolyn's little brother, Glenn, was tormented to, to the point where he would chase him with a, a hose. Yeah, they, she tells a story in there about how he was chasing the girls with the hose and they shut the door so that he ended up getting the laundry all wet. Right. Splash. Yes. So it does sound like a, a fun childhood with all these kids in the neighborhood. Yeah. It kind of sounds like what I did as a kid. Well, not Lee at least. Same place, yeah, same thing. And Christine remembers playing cricket and chasey in the street until dusk when their parents called them in for the night. I think chasey is kind of like tag. Right? Hide and seek, yeah. Hide and seek. I remember learning that term when we talked about William Tyrrell. Okay. So in 1978, Carolyn was at a party with some of her cousins, and she was introduced to Kevin Matthews. Now, her uncle worked with Kevin at Bow Repairs, a tire and auto parts chain in Australia. Yeah, Kevin made a good first impression on Carolyn. Yeah, good-looking guy, young, and he was interested in the same thing she was, life-saving. Right. Now, at 17, Carolyn received a Surf Life Saving Association of Australia's bronze medal, and she was one of the first women in the state to earn this award. She wasn't a particularly strong swimmer, but she was very involved, and she became a very respected and popular coach there. Yeah, I'm pretty impressed. Yeah. So Carolyn was only 14 when she met Kevin. He became quite controlling right away and often told her where she could go and what she could do. So they were a couple until Carolyn was 18. Then they broke up because he was cheating on her. So Carolyn refused to discuss the breakup with her girlfriends, though. She was private about that. Well, yeah. And, and who wants to admit that your boyfriend is cheating on you? Well, some girls are will share that with each other quite willingly, though. Yeah. Carolyn was a little more reserved than all of them. Well, I would be. I wouldn't be advertising that my loved one was cheating on me. Then you're a lot like Carolyn. See? Yep. So after the breakup, Carolyn moved with her friend Kayleen to Richmond, which is an area near Netley. She worked in the city with her mother doing sewing work, and she was, I guess, quite an excellent seamstress. Yeah, they said she didn't really have an interest in it, but she was so good at it, it ended up being her career. Yeah, and that's what she made her, her career of. Yes, she did pretty well. So it, it didn't take long, however, before Kevin and Carolyn got back together. Yeah, now Kevin and Carolyn lived with Kayleen and her husband Rodney for a while, and Kayleen remembers that Kevin would come home from work dirty after changing tires all day, and he was good about showering before he did anything else and keeping things neat. Kevin had had a pretty tough upbringing with very little money, and he seemed to be trying to improve himself by working hard, keeping up appearances. He was listening to classical music, trying to just improve upon himself. But after a while, those efforts just fell by the wayside. Rodney described him as a rude pig. He swore, and he didn't clean up after himself. So within two months, the household pretty much fell apart, and Kevin and Carolyn needed to move out on their own. Now, Carolyn's other friend, good friend, Christine, looked at Kevin as being an arrogant, controlling SOB. <laughs> Carolyn's fun-loving nature was squashed by Kevin. He didn't like Christine. And the relationship between Christine and Carolyn slowly fell apart. They still saw each other, but a lot less, and only when Kevin wasn't around. Yeah, she was not crazy about him. Doesn't sound like, I mean, here we have both her good friends from grade school and high school, Kayleen and Christine, neither of whom thought much of Kevin. Yeah. You, you so. know, there's some warning bells going off here. Right, but in spite of all that, they got married in 1984. True love wins out. So Carolyn really loved Kevin, but she was also pregnant, so that added to the reason why they got married then. Her friends wondered maybe she wouldn't have married him otherwise if she wasn't pregnant, but they knew her parents would have been really upset if she was pregnant non-married. So well, Carolyn, I'm sure they were probably upset anyway that she was pregnant before marriage. Well, maybe they got married quickly enough so they didn't have to know. Possibly. Now Carolyn and Kevin had their first son, Kenny, in May of 1985 followed by Shane and Daniel. Now, the boys became the focus of Carolyn's life. She worked long hours to get the boys what they wanted, and she also continued to dedicate some time to the surf club. Now, when they bought their first home just two suburbs north of Kayleen, the two women saw each other at their children's birthday parties. Kayleen said she saw two sides to Kevin. 
There was the smooth-talking good guy who could put down two bottles of scotch and be a jokester all evening. Now, are these regular bottles? I think so. And I put down two bottles of scotch, I'm in a coma. This guy had, you know, he'd been doing it for a while. He He, had a tolerance. He must have had this elusive, unlimited capacity. Well, he piled on the weight, I know that. Yeah. Then there was the Kevin at home, who was a different guy, and this Kevin was terrible to Carolyn, according to Kayleen. Kayleen was sad to see her friend with him because she was treated so badly. Yeah, and Carolyn started the business that we talked about with her friend Judith Roberts in 1989. This was called Bedspreads Plus. It was a soft furnishings company that was run out of Judith's home. Now, Kevin was moving up in the world of bow repairs. He went from tire fitter to regional manager. And by 2000, he was a respected member of the community. And by the time he was 40, he had a solid professional reputation. He also had a 15-year marriage to a loving woman, a nice home in the suburbs, and three healthy boys. He was president of the surf club for four years, and he won sales awards at work. So he looks like he's upwardly mobile. Well, he looks pretty good from the outside, at least, but then... A lot of people said in around 2000, something really changed. He became more reckless, more publicly rude, and talking about sex being very inappropriate. They even said he would pull out his penis at bars and dip it into his scotch to deter others from drinking it when he left for the bathroom. And now I read that and I almost fell off my chair laughing so hard. <laughs> I think it, wouldn't that burn, though, the alcohol? No. Putting your penis in alcohol wouldn't burn? Well, there's no exposed mucosal surfaces it's just skin it's like putting okay your, doctor <laughs> putting your finger in there but, all right, never but first mind. of all i'm looking at who, who's gonna think about drinking someone else's drink anyway you're, you're, i don't know if you're a bunch of drunks you might well maybe yeah that's true yeah but you know you're sitting at a bar everybody <laughs> tends to their own drink well nobody was touching his well i guess not sure. I, I for sure wouldn't do it right he's <laughs> dipping his penis into the drink yeah wow yeah. Yuck. Yes, yuck. So he would be found to be a man who wasn't respectful to women in general. Beneath the exterior of a family man and a professional, he was rather selfish. He was lecherous, and he was driven by only two things, and those things were lust and greed. Now, Michelle Burgess was just the right woman for him. Michelle was. Now, let's let's do a little bit about Michelle and her husband, Darren. Yes. So Darren and Michelle met when Michelle was only 15 years old. Now, she had a mischievous smile and a sly sensuality, even though she was only 15. This is in 1989. Darren was 18 years old. He had gone to a shopping mall with a friend, and they would noticed a concert in a nearby park. So he and his buddy stopped at the Modbury Hotel to have a few drinks, and they decided that the Christian-themed concert wasn't for them. So they went to the mall, but ended up returning to the concert. And outside of the concert, he first met Michelle, and she wasn't shy. She invited the two young men to sit with her and her girlfriends, and Michelle and Darren liked each other. She gave them her phone number, and within a week they were a couple. You know that happened fast. Right. Now, Darren was the youngest of three children in his family, And he had graduated high school in 1987, so he was a few years older than Michelle. He was good at sports, and he had a handful of friends, despite being quite shy. His ambition was to become a policeman, but he ended up working with his father at Beau Repairs. Now, Michelle had two older brothers and two younger sisters, so there are large families in these communities at this time. That's for sure. Her parents had divorced. Now, Michelle had left school before she completed year 10, Aside from working a couple of days a week at her father's air conditioning business, Michelle's first and only job was as a checkout clerk at the Big W at the Tea Tree Plaza. Now, Darren got along well with Michelle's father, Keith. They played some golf together, and they went to soccer games. Michelle and Darren both loved football. They went to the footy games and the surrounding social events together. See what I mean about the cute cute things? Footy footy, games, I like that. So they didn't have much else in common, though. Darren would say she was an attractive blonde at the time, and football seemed like enough to have in common. When you're young like that, you don't need much in common if you're attracted. You don't. That's about it. You just need 
looks. Right. Or attraction. Right. Now, Darren did learn some unattractive things about Michelle as they dated. At the disco on Saturday nights, Michelle and her girlfriends would throw themselves at the football players, and it didn't matter if boyfriends were along with them. Now, the two of them had fights about this behavior, but Michelle insisted that she was doing nothing wrong. Yeah, I'm, I'm not leading them on or flirting with them. I'm just talking with them. Well, I think she was doing more than that. He said throwing themselves at them. Well, yeah. There may have been makeouts going on. It might have been in the eye of the beholder. Sure. Now, Darren did try for his dream to be a police officer. He passed all of the written and physical tests, but they told him he was just too soft and too shy. He wouldn't make a good policeman, which doesn't seem fair to me. No. They should have given him more of a chance, I think. I, I wonder if that's true. I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe he... That's what he seemed to think. Well, that's what he thinks. Right. Yeah, but he might have been d doing that to save face. Well, we don't know. No, we don't. I'm just speculating. Okay. Now, Michelle was happy that his dream was dashed, and Darren entered a manager trainee program at Bow Repairs. He succeeded in that program and was made an assistant manager in Enfield in early 1991. Yeah, and that September, Darren and Michelle decided to buy land and build a home together. So Michelle stayed with a friend in Para Hills. One day after work, Darren decided to drive by and surprise her. When he pulled into the street, he saw Michelle's father's car parked in front of another house. He pulled up behind the car and saw Michelle was in the driver's seat and a man was in the passenger seat. The man was familiar to Darren as a neighbor, and he hopped right out of the car and ran off. So Darren was pretty distraught. She's already yeah. being unfaithful. I mean, this is not that far into the relationship. Well, he confronted her because they were going to go in on land together. And he decided, which I think pretty wisely, to go ahead and buy the land on his own, and he broke up with her. He told her that he knew she was using him just for money and the use of his car. Yeah, isn't that a teenage thing? Yeah. You know, you just want me for my car. Well, she didn't have a job. She really didn't buy anything of her own. So days later, he went to her place to pick up some of his things. And she had the new boyfriend, the neighbor who'd been in the car with her before, already there. So Darren felt really confused and hurt by this. So he stayed away from her, but then in a couple of months, Darren received a call from Michelle's mother. And she complained that Michelle's new boyfriend had assaulted her. Michelle was upset and she wanted to see Darren, she said. So Darren, being the nice guy, he felt sorry for her and he contacted her. Soon after, Darren took Michelle to Melbourne for Australia Day weekend. But Michelle spent the weekend calling her old boyfriend from payphones. Yeah. So let's let's just recap this. Sure. She's with <laughs> Darren. Yes. They break up because she's canoodling with another guy. They get back together because he was abusive to her. They go away for the weekend, and she spends the weekend calling old boyfriends. Yeah, she's really not a nice girlfriend. So despite her behavior, the relationship continued. Now, Darren must be some kind of idiot. Oh, that sounds mean, but he was a bit of a doormat. I wouldn't call him an idiot, but I think he did put up with an awful lot. Well, yeah. He just did wait. catch we on later. We haven't even gotten to all that stuff yet. I know, but he finally did get out of the relationship. We can say that. So on a Friday soon after they got back together, Michelle went out with a girlfriend. Darren went to see her the next day, and her mother told him that she'd never come home. So Darren called Michelle's friend afterwards, and she told Darren that their friend Mark was with her and was supposed to drive her home. Now Darren, being a really bright guy, assumed that Michelle had spent the night with Mark, but he still stuck with her. He did. Now soon after, Michelle told Darren that she was pregnant with his baby. Now he really had doubts about it being his baby but decided to stay with her and do the right thing, as he thought, and take care of the baby. So he moved into Michelle's parents' home with her, and Michelle ended up having a son. Of course, Darren wasn't sure if he was the biological father, but he decided to be the boy's father, and he said he was happy to have a healthy son. So he ended up proposing to Michelle shortly after. And after that, he was transferred to work in a store in Mildura, and they moved in December of 1992. Yeah, but neither of them liked life in Mildura. They didn't like his new boss either. 
Darren became friendly with the assistant manager, whose place he was taking at the news store. We'll call him Larry, because his name hasn't been revealed. Yeah, so anybody named Larry out there, I'm sorry. Yeah. I thought we wouldn't have a lot of listeners named Larry, so we'd use that name. We never know. Right. They moved into a two-bedroom rental in Mildura, but Michelle visited her home often, and Darren was wondering if she was cheating on him again because she's constantly taking home pregnancy tests. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, that's a bad sign if you're Isn't not it? having a lot of sex. So. so after Larry joined the family dinner and a football game one night, Michelle went to drive him home. She didn't return. Darren tried to call her repeatedly, but she didn't answer her phone. Almost two hours late, Michelle turned up. She said that she had stayed to watch a movie with Larry and his cousins. So Darren, of course, was suspicious. Now, shortly after, Larry transferred to another store. Right, but their affair did continue for a while after that, too, I believe, right? Yes, it did. Now, Darren was able to get a transfer back to Adelaide in 1993. He and Michelle moved into a unit behind Darren, Darren's parents' house while they tried to save for a house. But just weeks after their return, Michelle was cheating on him again. So they're not even married yet. Nope. So and, and she's... What, I'm, I've lost count, but it's got to be close to half a dozen guys that we know about right. that she was cheating on Darren with. Right. And nevertheless, the stupid bastard decides <laughs> to marry her. Okay, you're picking on Darren. I am. Okay. Well, two weeks before their wedding day, Darren found a letter in their car. Now, this letter was written by Michelle to morning TV host Denise Drysdale. And it was asking for advice. I guess this is some kind of TV advice lady in Australia at the time. Now, the letter said that she had fallen in love and had an affair with Larry. So he's got proof right there that she'd been having an affair with Larry. But he goes ahead with the wedding as planned. And they were married on November 20th of 1993. So as much as he knew that he should, Darren said, he still didn't call it off because he felt pressure from his parents, who'd spent a lot of money preparing for the wedding. Plus, he has the son, so he stuck with her. Yeah, he did. So they get married, and he's working at Beau Repairs. They're at a Christmas party, a work party, and Michelle met Kevin and Carolyn Matthews. So here we have the coming together of the two families. Yes. She had nothing good to say about either of them. Now, Darren understood why she didn't like Kevin, because... He was crude and treated his wife badly. But he didn't understand what she had against Carolyn, who seemed to be the opposite of Kevin, just a nice, even-tempered woman. Yeah, but I don't think Michelle liked a lot of women, right? Because she was no, just more into sleeping I, with guys. I think <laughs> Michelle didn't like any woman because they'd all be potential rivals. Because she really did seem like she'd have sex with any man. If you got a penis. That, <laughs> it's true. I it's think just that's sounds, It sounds pretty crude, but you're right. So, Michelle had an affair with a co-worker of Darren's for the next three years until he was transferred to another store. Now, during this affair, Darren and Michelle were having a house built, and they had a daughter. Shortly after they moved into the new house, Michelle came up pregnant again. Now, Darren knew for sure that this pregnancy wasn't his, and they discussed the financial stress they were under, and Michelle agreed to get an abortion. So she had an abortion. Right. Because things were getting worse at home. Much worse. Michelle didn't work, but she was always asking Darren for more spending money. And he was doing this, giving her the money, just for the sake of their children. He wanted the family to stay together. Yeah, so this is the point where he starts getting um, yeah, into the starting, alcohol. Yeah, he starting to drink pretty heavily. Got caught drinking and driving in March of 2000. So he's worried. I mean, the... He's sure. going to lose his job. So he went to Kevin Matthews the next day, who was now his regional manager. And Darren thinks that maybe Kevin can help him. And in fact, he did. He put in a good word for Darren, and somehow Darren kept his job. He lost his driver's license for six months and became dependent on Michelle for transportation. Yeah, so this is the time when Michelle and Kevin really became friendly, That we think, right? We think so. So he's he's entered their lives a little more th thoroughly. Yes. Now, at first, it was kind of out in the open, like he was a family friend, but soon Michelle was getting secretive with her phone and having these texting conversations with Kevin. 
and we won't ever know exactly what it was that so radically altered Michelle's opinion of Kevin. Because remember, she thought he was a jerk. When she did have first a penis, though. So, like you said, yeah. that's a bonus. It, it works for her. <laughs> but she soon was exchanging dozens and dozens of text messages with the man she had once contemptuously dismissed as a pig dog. Pig dog is a bad epithet. <laughs> so she wanted to be wanted again, just as she had been by the other men with whom she'd had affairs. She apparently loved illicit meetings in parks and hotels for forbidden sex. Yes, so in August of 2000, Darren had bought his own mobile phone, and he also updated Michelle's, putting both in his name. But Michelle chose not to use the new phone, instead going out the same day and buying her own and opening an account with Vodafone. So that's very suspicious. That's not okay. I don't know why Darren thought that's okay, but... She was free to flirt with whoever she chose, and Kevin Matthews by this time was a fat, bald, married man, and of course he had a foul mouth. But there was some desire between the two of them. So Michelle's friend at the time, Cassandra Hutchinson, recalls that about two weeks before Darren's birthday, in September of 2000, Michelle told her as she was exchanging text messages with Kevin Matthews and that he had asked her to be his mistress. So she made a clear their relationship had become intimate. On at least three occasions, Cassandra saw a gray Ford Falcon parked at Michelle's home, usually around lunchtime or late morning. When Darren and Michelle had a Beau Repairs Christmas party at their house in December of 2000, Cassandra saw the same car with the Matthews family arriving in it. So bingo. Right. There we go. But I don't think it was a mystery to anyone, right? Well, it wasn't really. It seems like it's pretty out in the open. Well, they were having outdoor sex. They were. Where anybody could see them. They weren't them. very careful. Now, Cassandra's friend, Jaylene Thompson, recalled some similar incidents around mid-2000 after being introduced to Cassandra's friend and neighbor, who lived two doors away. Now, she saw Michelle at Cassandra's home two or three times up until September 2000. On one occasion, they were having a barbecue, and a few weeks prior to this, Cassandra had told Jaylene that Michelle was having an affair with a man named Kevin, who was actually Darren's boss. Now at the barbecue, Jaylene recalled standing with Cassandra and Michelle under the pagola when the subject of Darren's boss came up. Michelle told them she was having an affair with Kevin, just came right out and said it. Well, she admitted it all the time. But not to Darren, not to people who counted. Of course not. But no. any, anyone else, all their girlfriends, yeah, I'm having sex with them. She kind of bragged about it. Yeah. Now, on another evening, Jaylene joined Michelle and Cassandra at the Village Tavern in Golden Grove. And within minutes of arriving, Michelle started a text messaging marathon, telling them Kevin was in his lounge room and his wife was sitting nearby. She loved it that it was happening right under Carolyn's nose. Now, while the other women danced, Michelle kept texting at one stage having a conversation with Kevin while he was hiding in his toilet at home. Yeah, this is very arrested development, isn't it? I mean, these are acting like teenagers. They are. So Darren says that in the lead-up to his 30th birthday, which is September 2000, he recalled that Michelle would go out with Cassandra and a couple of her girlfriends. The next day, he noticed what looked like a hickey on Michelle's chest. Whoa. Question her about it, and she insisted someone had pinched her the night before in the nightclub. <laughs> yeah, right. And he says, absolute bullshit. She honestly thought I was stupid. Well, he was well, being stupid. I was stupid for everything I put up with, but not stupid enough that I didn't know what was going on. So that's where well, he was living, right in that narrow hallway between putting up with too much, but knowing what's going on. Exactly. Maneuvering down that narrow hallway walkway. And he keeps bumping into the walls because it's so narrow. (laughs) Sure, it's getting narrower. Yep. Now, in another incident shortly before his birthday, Michelle told Darren she had to stay at the Hindley Park Royal in the city because she had some sort of training for a job that she claimed to have been given at their son's school, and it required an overnight stay. But Michelle dropped by at his work before mid-morning the next day, and Darren questioned her about why she was back so early. Now, she claimed that some of the other people on the course had misbehaved, so the training had been called off for the day. So what was she doing at a hotel that night? I'm sure Darren had his suspicions. I'm sure he was correct in his suspicions. Yeah. 
So police later established that the first known phone call between Kevin Matthews and Michelle Burgess was September 4, 2000. He used his work mobile to call her mobile. Then a few days later, Darren and Michelle had a discussion about the guest list for his 30th birthday party. Two days after his birthday was when the party was to take place. But Darren was firm in his instructions. I don't want Kevin there, he told her. Well, it's too late. I've already mentioned it to him. I've invited him and his wife, Michelle said. Well, why? Why, he asked, yeah. Well, he's at all the Christmas parties, and he's your boss, so it'd be good for you if he's here. Well, I can kind of see that. Well, now, yeah, maybe if they weren't sleeping together. Right. But that but, puts a whole new spin on things. But if you things. just look at it on the surface... Even yeah. though he didn't want his boss invited. I mean, it's good public relations to invite your boss to this stuff. If your wife wasn't sleeping with him, though, well, I mean, that I mean, changes the whole... <laughs> that's that's a whole different perspective. <laughs> sure. But if, if we just look at it innocently... Well, I don't know why you would, though. I'm unless you've to. got your head in the sand. Well, Darren does. Well, somewhat. But like you said, he knew what was going on. So the Burgesses hosted the Bow Repairs... Elizabeth Christmas parties at their house each year. And because Kevin was regional manager, Darren would invite him and Carolyn to the parties. Now he recalls that at their first party in 1997, he showed Kevin around his home, and in the master bedroom, Kevin commented, So this is where all the work gets done. Uh huh. <laughs> because Michelle disliked both Kevin and Carolyn, she didn't want them in her house at that point. But now their attitudes had reversed, and they were the opposite. Yeah, she loves Kevin, and Darren loathes Kevin. Right, right. So Darren says, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Here's a woman who hated Kevin and Carolyn immensely, didn't want them in our house at Christmas time, and all of a sudden she's invited into my birthday party. I asked her why, and she said that her opinion of Kevin and Carolyn had changed. She told me that she and Kevin had talked and that they had some things in common, with the troubles they had in their marriages. Well, I'll say they did. Well, more than troubles. Yeah, but I mean, they had the exact same thing in common. They're both cheating on their spouse. Right. So Michelle later confided to another woman that on her husband's birthday, she had gone to Kevin Matthews' office and had sex with him there. Kevin, for his part, had never experienced anything like it. He was terrified they'd be caught, but he also loved it. It made it more arousing for him. Well, that's why they moved into the park out in the in public. She would arrive at his office with hungry eyes, wandering hands, and a proposition. So according to him, she said to him, I want to be your mistress. Yeah, and Kevin apparently agreed. Seems like it. Right there in the office. Yep. Yep. Or in the park, wherever. Or wherever we can go. Right. And, and they were quite busy. We're, we're going to talk about this. They were very active. Yes. So four more calls occurred between Kevin and Michelle over the following days. On the Saturday morning before his birthday party at their home, a suspicious Darren began browsing the messages on his wife's phone. Yes. When he discovered a message containing directions to Bow Repair's head office, which was sent from Kevin's phone, he confronted his wife. Now She gave a lame explanation for this. I had a feeling you were going through my phone. And I put that in there myself to catch you. So now, she's, come quick on. With the, are, she's quick with the Are you going to believe that? No. Now that morning she told Darren she was going to buy his birthday present, but she was gone all morning. So when she finally returned, she explained her extended absence by saying she had caught the train around the corner from where she bought the present, which was a Port Adelaide football club tracksuit. So the guests at the party that night included the Burgess's close friends, Brad and Sarah Creighton. Sarah later told police that she was very surprised to see Kevin and Carolyn there. Michelle told her Darren had invited them and gave the impression that she was only tolerating them for Darren's sake. But Sarah immediately picked up on Michelle's new attitude towards Kevin, talking and laughing with him like they were old friends. She also noticed that Michelle seemed to avoid Carolyn completely, and she didn't see them speak at all during the evening. So, some warning things here. Yeah. Now, shortly after the affair had started, Michelle created a ruse to give herself even more time outside the home. Because remember, she's not working. No. She's but, too busy, damn it. Yeah, she Where would sure she fit is. in a job? I know. 
But Michelle told Darren she had a job at Evanston Primary School, which their son attended, and the job involved canvassing local businesses to sponsor the school. Now, this would require Michelle to do some training and even overnight stays in Adelaide hotels, such as her visit to the Hindley Park Royal. She would drop off her daughter at her mother's home in Holden Hill while she went off to her job. Yeah, her so-called job. Her very so-called job. So So Darren would say, I guess having experienced this before, I suspected there was an affair happening. Well, you know, (laughs) how many times do you have to get hit upside the head before you start figuring things out? I know, he really did put up with too much. Oh. But he said he would question... It pisses me off. At him? At him. Well, but what about her? Does it piss you off about her? Well, in a different way. I mean, she's... She's just a lizard who will screw anything. Yeah. But this guy is so whatever. He keeps overlooking her sexual escapades and stays with her. Well, he said he would question her all the time, but she would constantly deny it. At lunchtime, he would ring both Kevin and Michelle, and as luck would have it, both of their phones were off, and he would leave messages for them both to ring him back. Surprise, surprise, they would both ring back sim- simultaneously as soon as they switched their phones back on at the same time. Well, that's suspicious stuff again. Well, of course. But, but he knows what's going on. He does. Do something about it. Well, he needed to leave her. Now, also that September, Kevin Matthews rewarded himself with an extravagant gift because he was approaching his 40th birthday. Now, ignoring the fact that his family's finances were already stretched, He took out a $17,500 loan to buy a speedboat. And then he named the boat Baji, which was, I guess, his nickname. Yeah. Is that how you say it? Baji? Baji. Yeah. Sounds like a good nickname for him. (laughs) So I I think a a Baji would be a good name for him. Okay. Now, Carolyn's friend Kaylin and her husband Rodney thought it was odd that they weren't invited to Kevin's 40th birthday party in October of 2000. Now, it was only later that Kayleen found out it was actually Carolyn who insisted they did not be included. She thought her husband would humiliate her that night, and she was right. Yeah, now Michelle and a reluctant Darren were, were among the party guests. Kevin had called Darren earlier that day and said they were welcome to stay the night. Darren was incredulous. Was Kevin serious? Because he still didn't have his driver's license, he'd already booked a room at a nearby hotel correctly guessing that Michelle would end up in no shape to drive. So they took a bottle of scotch for the birthday boy. Now for Kevin Matthews, there was no such thing as too much scotch. Indeed, the party decorations included a bottle of scotch hooked up to a drip. So he was ecstatic that his birthday gifts, including those from colleagues and business acquaintances, included no less than 52 bottles of scotch, in varying shapes and sizes. I'm, I'm just flabbergasted at that. I mean, I don't know how big a party it was, but to score over 50 bottles of alcohol? Well, I, I guess everyone knew that that's what he liked, though. I guess they were going by recommendations. So then to top that off, he spent most of the evening squiring Michelle around with his arm around her waist, introducing her to the guests as his new best friend. <laughs> and Darren was there just watching that. Yeah, he kept noticing that Kevin's friendly arm was around his wife several times, but he chose to keep the peace. He always did. And he also noticed Michelle was drinking scotch and coke, rather than her usual strongbow, which I think is a hard cider. Okay. So she got steadily more drunk, and her affection for Kevin became more obvious to everyone at the party. Darren decided it was best if he stopped drinking, because (laughs) it looked like things were about to get out of hand. Well, and well, they did, because later in the evening, Michelle was uh, vomiting in the bathroom. Right. So by she, herself, though. Well, that's one good thing, I guess. I mean, I guess she'd been in that bathroom on her knees before for other reasons. Ooh. <laughs> so while all this stuff is happening, there's an altercation between Kevin, some of Kevin's family members, and several Boa Repair's managers. Yeah, let's include everybody here. It's like a brawl. So one of Kevin's family members started targeting Darren, but Kevin interjected, saying, leave him alone, he's one of my best managers. Now, Darren eventually extracted Michelle from the toilet, 
but with the state she was in, nobody would give them a ride. Well, the taxi didn't want her to vomit in their car, so they're not going to pick her up. Well, who wants that? Now, Darren says, I went against everything I believed in. I had sworn that while I didn't have my license, I wouldn't drive. But I felt that desperate times called for desperate measures. So he bundled Michelle into their car and drove around to the hotel and put Michelle in bed. He said she was so intoxicated that by the morning when he woke her, she had soiled herself. That's attractive. That's pretty bad. Yeah. That's seriously drunk. That's comatose drunk. So on Tuesday, October 24th, 2000, this is after the party, Kevin Matthews booked a standard room with a queen-size bed at the Novotel Adelaide on Hindley Street. He checked in at 10 o'clock in the morning. Records show that he watched The Patriot on the in-house movie system, ate a lunch that included two chicken burgers, wedges, and orange juice, and then checked out at 411 paying the $163.75 bill. Though there's more than one person there, unless he needed two chicken sandwiches. Well, why would a man go in the day and rent a hotel for himself? Come on. On November 8th, there was a booking in the name of Burgess for a spa room at the airport motel in Brooklyn Park. Now, on that same day, the White Horse Inn at Boulevard charged seventy six ninety to Kevin Matthews indicating he was stocking up on drinks ahead of another night in a hotel. The following day, Kevin caught a flight to Melbourne and returned on November 11th. So leading up to Christmas 2000, Michelle told Darren she wanted a tattoo as a memorial for the baby they had aborted. It was of a rose in the small of her back. At the regular Christmas party at the Burgesses' home that month, a grim Carolyn Matthews walked in from the backyard to speak to Darren. Now Darren would recall what Carolyn said to him. Michelle was so proud of her tattoo, she was parading it around to everyone who wanted to look. And he remembers Carolyn coming up to him in his kitchen and saying, Your wife is out there showing her arse to my husband. (laughs) Then another guest at the party says, Michelle came out with the tramp stamp on her back. (laughs) And Darren said, She didn't get it for me. Wow. And Michelle's saying, Oh no, I got it for Darren. But we all knew. It was a weird party. Sounds like a weird party. That probably doesn't even begin to describe it. Yeah. Well, Darren recalled that the night ended strangely, too. Carolyn and her boys wanted to leave, but Kevin did not. So they did leave, but then they returned, trying to convince Kevin that he needed to come home with his family. Now, how pathetic is this? One of the boys actually took his father's drink off the table and coaxed him out to the car with it, kind of like a carrot on a stick. Yeah, it's kind of pitiful. That's very pathetic that the son had to do that. I would say Carolyn's almost as bad as Darren for what she puts up with. Uh Uh-huh, I agree. So in mid-December, there was another Bow Repairs Christmas party, this time at the home of Robert, who was Darren's former boss at the Elizabeth store. Sarah Creighton recalled that Michelle and Kevin were together for most of the evening, laughing and chatting. Michelle stayed clear of Carolyn, and she was again drinking scotch and coke rather than Strongbow, despite the last time she had an acquaintance with coke (laughs) and scotch. Yeah, it didn't go down well. came up even faster. Sure. (laughs) So during the evening, there was an awkward movement when Robert asked Michelle what she did, and she told him she worked on Mondays and did a course on Fridays. (laughs) Yeah, this is funny. And Robert said, what, intercourse? (laughs) (laughs) There was a few people that laughed, but for some reason... Kevin and Michelle thought it was hilarious. Well, sure. Besides being drunk, they have the secret. They are raunchy people, can I just say? I think so. These are like a couple of the raunchiest folks ever. (laughs) So Carolyn and Kevin left the party early, around 10. Michelle's mood immediately changed into a bad one. Sarah had agreed to drive home Darren and Michelle because they had arrived in a taxi. But now Michelle didn't want to wait for the party to end. She wanted to go straight home. Well, her lover's gone. Yeah, why stay? Right. Now, Robert said his wife and Sarah had been sitting back from the crowd that evening and observing everything that was going on. After Michelle left, his wife told him, there's something going on there. But Robert didn't believe it. He dismissed it. He said, that's bullshit. You don't know what you're talking about. But she clearly did. Yeah. Plus, I I think you women have a better innate sense of that kind of stuff. Do you? I do. Maybe. Maybe. I think that maybe we pay more attention, at least. 
I know I pay more attention to things like that than you do. Oh, really? Yeah. Like what? Just observing people and how their moods are and how they act with each okay. other. I'll I think I'm more that. in tune with that. I think so. Now, the intensity of this relationship, though, is making it quite public. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, a lot of people already know or suspect that something's going on. But, like I said, Kevin and Michelle really didn't seem to care. Not at all. Now, on December 19th, they returned to the Novotel on Hindley Street, checked in around 10.30 a.m., ordered room service throughout the day, and then checked out at 5.47 p.m. The next day, it was the South Park Adelaide on South Terrace in the city. Kevin checked in at 9 a.m. and paid for food and drinks, a bill of $35, and then he checked out at 4.53 p.m. So, back-to-back -back days. Now, can I just say, this takes a lot of nerve. I could never, in a weekday, I mean, forget the affair. I just couldn't skip work and go stay, spend the day in a hotel eating and watching movies. I'd feel so guilty just for that. Well, that's, but that's then you. Throw in the infidelity and uh, spending the money, and I would just, I couldn't do it. Huh. I'd be beside myself. With too much stress. So these people are very um, hedonistic, I think, is a great word for these two. That, that works. Because they seem to indulge every desire they have. It's all about, you know, them having pleasure in whatever way they want. Overeating, drinking, sex, whatever. You got it. Yeah. Michelle was making her move, and she's giving Kevin a taste of what he would miss out on unless he left his wife. So that's, uh -huh. what Michelle was, that's what Michelle was getting at at this point. She at this point, anyway. Yeah, at this point. Now, Michelle's friend Cassandra Hutchinson says she told her that at Christmas she had given Kevin an ultimatum to leave Carolyn by mid-January. If that didn't happen, she would stop the sex. Cut him off. You got it. Now, she's pretty sure of herself, isn't she? She is. Michelle said Kevin had agreed, and when the Matthews family returned from a Christmas holiday, he was going to leave. Cassandra was quite appalled at the whole situation, and she resolved herself that she was going to try and stop this affair. So she sent an anonymous letter to Kevin at his work address, explaining that people knew about the affair, and if they didn't stop, Carolyn was going to be told. Of course, though, I believe Carolyn knew. Now, Cassandra later told police, I didn't intend for it to be an ultimatum. I thought it would scare them both into realizing what they were doing that there were two families at risk here. I think I said in the letter that they were acting like children and that they were to halt the affair before Christmas. So, of course, this didn't work. No, of course not. Her attempts at mothering these people were a, a big failure. Very big. So on December 22nd, Haleen and Rodney Kenyon and their two sons made the trek from their Hills property to the Matthews home at West Lakes Shore. Two couples were relaxing in the outdoor entertaining area. Kids were jumping in and out of the pool. It's a languid summer evening. I remember Australia is the southern hemisphere, so this is summer in December. Right, right. Just good in reminder. case people were picking up on that. It's a good reminder because I forget that stuff. Carolyn seemed preoccupied. Her father was gravely ill. She'd been spending a lot of time with him because he wasn't expected to make it to the end of the year. They talked about Doug, their father, each other's work, and the Matthews' life-saving activities. Then at 8 p.m., Kevin's phone started receiving text messages, and there were lots of them. Kevin passed the phone around to his guest to show the messages, which said the unidentified sender needed Kevin to come out. Now, Carolyn said, Kevin, you're not going anywhere. Right. Well, the guess, messages... guess who they're coming from? Now he's passing it around. A woman on his phone is claiming to have slashed her wrist and was demanding that he visit her in an unidentified hospital. So this was a weird ploy. Kevin weird. and Carolyn started discussing some problems he was having with one of his managers. Now Kevin seemed quite open about showing the messages around. While these messages were coming in, Kevin and Carolyn spoke about calls they had received at the house both threatening calls as well as calls that hung up when they were answered. Right, so if we ring the hospitals and no one by that name has been admitted, then he doesn't have to go anywhere. That's right, that's right, Kevin, she said, warming to the idea after the women went inside to make the calls. Rodney spoke quietly to Kevin. Now look, Kevin, if you're doing something wrong, come clean and get it out in the open. But Kevin was adamant. No, there's nothing going on. 
Well, Kayleen would recall, we made calls, but I remember the name as Michelle Green, not Burgess. I remember feeling a sense of satisfaction. You can just stay here with your guests. So he stayed, and the messages continued, and he got quite well. He was pacing around all the time, and he hardly sat down. So she said he made it uncomfortable, but that was kind of Kevin's style anyway. So Kayleen just decided to ignore him and enjoy her time with Carolyn. But we can tell at this point, Kayleen's just done with Kevin. I think everybody pretty much is, except Carolyn. Exactly. So in addition to Kevin's suspected philandering, Carolyn was coping with the imminent loss of her father. Now, he had emphysema, which was diagnosed or had been diagnosed 18 months earlier, and it would lead to lung cancer. So this is pretty much a death sentence. Yes, that's what they're saying, yeah. So his wife Yvonne had retired, and they packed up the camper van, determined to spend every remaining minute together. Now, he was originally given six months to live, but he defied the prognosis and was still alive 18 months later. But by Christmas time in 2000, his condition was deteriorating rapidly. He came home from hospital that month to be surrounded by his family, because he's going to die. Right, and Carolyn wanted to spend time with him. Yeah. Now, Charlie Titswell recalled that his sister Carolyn would come over often and was deeply upset by her father's illness. Doug passed away on Christmas Eve, and his funeral was on Boxing Day. Carolyn was devastated at the loss of her father, but there was really no support or comfort from her husband. Kayleen remembered that Doug and Carolyn had become very close during his illness, and Kayleen went to the funeral with Rodney, Kevin, Carolyn, and the children. Then they returned to the family home in Netley for the wake. Now watching on the back veranda, Christine and Kayleen saw that Carolyn was running around trying to do everything. And each time they went into the lounge room, which I guess is like a living room to us, right? Right. Or den, TV yeah. room, something like that. Right. They found Kevin watching TV and drinking. And the only time he came out to where the guests were was to refill his drink. So when the wake had ended, Carolyn rushed home and packed up their van with everything the family would need because they were driving off for a holiday at the park in Riverland. Now, Kayleen said Kevin was really, really arrogant and didn't lift a finger to help her. He drank, and Carolyn ran around and did everything, as well as trying to be there for her mother, who just lost her husband. So Kayleen said, what an arsehole, but that's Kevin for you. Yeah, and her other friend Christine was equally appalled. He sat on his arse and drank scotch, not a care about what she was feeling. Her dad meant a great deal to her. She was daddy's girl, but he didn't care. One little bit. No. So without Michelle around to cajole him, Kevin backed out of the plan to tell Carolyn he was leaving her. Well, that might have been okay. Her father just had died. She doesn't need to be told her husband's leaving her. Well, I agree. But it's not like he's being nice to her, though. <laughs> well, I wasn't saying that. Oh, kind of not that helpful. So, but yeah, I guess he was thinking that with his father-in-law just passing, uh, he didn't think it would be a good time to tell her he was leaving her. Well, sure. Now, on Christmas Day, Darren noticed Michelle wearing a gold necklace, and when he asked her where it came from, she said she bought it from a jewelry store for $10. Now, he remembers that he thought that was total bullshit, because it looked a lot more expensive than that. And in the next couple of days, he went to that jewelry store, and he saw a similar necklace, and it cost hundreds of dollars. Uh Uh-huh. So Darren also overheard a conversation that day between Michelle and Michelle's brother's wife. Now, Michelle said she was thinking about getting another tattoo on her backside, this time of Daffy Duck. Now, Darren asked, why would you do that? And she said, because Daffy Duck is my favorite cartoon character. But we come to find out that that was her nickname. That's what Kevin called her, Daffy. So Darren, he was out front of the home playing soccer with his kids on Boxing Day when Michelle took a call from a woman who called herself Julie, who asked to speak to him. Now, she didn't recognize the voice of her neighbor, Cassandra Hutchinson. Michelle called Darren to the phone, and Cassandra said, Your wife's having an affair with Kevin Matthews. Then Cassandra hung up. Now, Darren was getting more angry, but, I mean, Darren already knew this. He did. He had to. Well, yeah. Right. Now, Darren says, I rang Kevin up and told him what I'd been told, and that I would beat the living fuck out of him. 
I think this was around the time Carolyn's father died. That's correct? Yes. And Kevin was not happy with what he was hearing. He just hung up. Right. So Darren then began arguing with Michelle, leading him to searching her car for more evidence of the affair. So he found the jewelry box from the necklace, and he found a Christmas card that read, Chuck loves Daffy. So those were their nicknames for each other. And it said, this is just enough to tide you over to Christmas. Don't spend it on scotch. Right. So he confronts Michelle again. And she said it was from one of the guys on one of the courses, which she claimed to have completed. He fancied her, but she had rejected him, she insisted. Well, that's not likely. No, she if doesn't If somebody reject fancied her, she wouldn't reject him. No, probably not. The next day, Darren again called Kevin, who was on holiday in the Riverland and in the car with his family. Darren launches into a tirade about the affair. Kevin quickly took the phone off hands-free and told him to wait until he got out of the car. Well, that was wise. I think so. He didn't want his whole family to hear about this. No. So Darren says he swore in his kids' lives that he was not having an affair with Michelle. But the conversation didn't last that long. Well, no. So Darren went to stay with a friend uh, at the end of December. He was in turmoil over what he should be doing. But instead of making divorce his New Year's resolution, he asked Michelle to spend New Year's Eve with him. So he must have had some feelings for her, because he keeps going back to her, and I don't quite understand that. I, it's just beyond my comprehension. I mean ever since they were dating. She's had numerous, numerous affairs. There must have been some kind of appeal she had with men. Something was attracting them, unless it was just the plain old sluttiness. But with Darren, it couldn't have been that. Well, sluttiness only goes so far. That's what I thought. From, but from a guy's standpoint. I you would know, think so, but it seems you, to be working for her. You like those slutty girls for a short time, and then you're going to move on from them. Well, that doesn't seem to be the case here, though. That's for sure. She must have more than that. So he had tickets to a basketball game, right? And then he took her to it, and then they came home together. But he slept on the couch. Now Darren says that Carolyn and Kevin wanted to hold a meeting with them to clear the air in early January, but Michelle wasn't interested. Now on January 5th, Kevin checked into a room at the South Park in Adelaide again at around 9.30 a.m. and stayed until 4.15 p.m., and after yet another day of sex with Michelle, Carolyn called Darren, and Darren remembered that she wanted to ask him what he thought about the rumors that their spouses were having an affair. So at the end of that conversation, she also asked him, oh, is Michelle okay? And he said, well, okay, why do you ask? And she said, well, with the stabbing. <laughs> and he said, well, what stabbing? So Carolyn said, well, just before Christmas, you walked in and found Michelle on the floor stabbed, sitting alongside your son. So this was obviously some <laughs> lie that Kevin had told her. Well, yeah. So he couldn't believe what he was hearing, but he remembered the night Carolyn was talking about. It was just before Christmas, and Michelle had gone to the Servo for cigarettes. I guess that's a store, Servo. Yeah. A little convenience store. Okay. But she was gone for over an hour. And she told him that she'd run into one of her friend's husbands and was chatting with him. So well, Carol maybe she ran into the penis of the husband. <laughs> right. Well, I think she was with Kevin because Carolyn said, well, Kevin called you the following day to find out how she was. And he said, well, no, he didn't. So a lot of lies going on here. Mm -hmm. So he told Carolyn that he did believe that Kevin and Michelle were actually having an affair. But she was in denial. She didn't want to believe it. So around the time of this call, possibly a little bit after, Carolyn also called Michelle, and she told her to stay away from her husband. But, I mean, clearly Michelle ignored that. And after his conversation with Carolyn, Darren called his wife and told her it was time for them to talk. So they Finally. met... Finally. Yeah, which didn't end up doing any good anyway. Well, I know, but at least we're starting to move in the right direction. Right, so they met, and Michelle maintained her policy of completely denying it, and Darren told her, this is where it all began. I guess they met where they met when they were kids. And he said, this is where it all began. Maybe this is where it all should finish. Right. Darren suggested they needed to be alone to talk and work out a solution to the situation. Michelle agreed and arranged for the children to stay at her mother's, 
Now, Darren was uncomfortable at the home and booked a room at the Lakes Resort at West Lakes. Now, even while they're packing, Michelle's texting Kevin. She also sent a message to Carolyn from Darren's phone and immediately deleted it so he couldn't read it. Ah, jeez. Carolyn later told Darren that the text, which she naturally assumed was from him, said that she was not to contact him or Michelle again. Uh, this hotel stay was a total failure. Michelle locked herself in the bathroom and stayed in the spa for the evening, again engaging in a text message marathon. And nothing ever got discussed. But don't you think at this point in the relationship, they don't? there's nothing to discuss? I mean, the marriage there's, is over. There's absolutely nothing to discuss. What is he going to talk to her about? She's lying. She's cheating. She has no intention or desire to fix anything. No, she doesn't. Clearly. So I so don't understand what the whole is. Darren's got to step up and do something. Well, I would think so. The next day, a 28-page itemized phone bill for $1,200 arrived in their letterbox and the for, bill for one month yeah now the bill also showed a previous account for sixteen hundred dollars so God, pay... i'd have a stroke if i got those <laughs> bills <laughs> you would i know and they can't afford it at all nope now page after page was filled with calls and text messages to kevin matthews mobile phone aside from the night at west lakes darren had continued to stay with a friend but on the day the bill arrived, he was back at home looking after his kids because Michelle had supposedly returned to her fantasy job at the primary school that day. Now, this was despite the fact that school wasn't even in session. Yeah, I'm at my job, right. Yeah. Now, Michelle had already told Darren about the big bills, but she claimed they were in relation to her job and that the school had paid them. But now he's got the hard evidence that they hadn't been paid. And, right. And he was pretty furious. But again, I'm thinking, well, you stupid jerk, how much does it have to be? Well, he keeps getting angry, yes, but he doesn't leave. I know. All I can think is, you know, he's there for the kids, I guess. That's the only reasonable thing I can put together here. Or that he's a jerk. Well, I think you're picking on him too much. Well, just, like I said, just angers me. Yes. That put up with all this stuff for as long as he did. Yeah, but he's a good person. Well, okay. Yeah. What's that got to do with anything? Well, it has a lot to do with this story, because we're talking about some bad people. So that afternoon, one of Michelle's friends, Kathy Cowled, called the house. Now, she wanted Michelle to pick her up from the train station with her kids and take them home. Darren told her Michelle wasn't home, but he was happy to do it. So on the drive, Kathy said to Darren, Well, you know Michelle's having an affair with your boss, Kevin and proceeded to tell Darren everything Michelle had told her. Now, after dropping off Kathy, Darren called Michelle, but he got the usual denials. Then he called Kevin, who did the same thing. <laughs> but he had manned up. He said to Kevin, I just want to thank you. Yeah, and Kevin says, thank me for what? For, for taking that stupid bitch off my hands. Ha! Huh. So go Darren. What do you mean, go Darren? This. Well, finally. Oh, God. <laughs> so he tells Kevin, it's the best thing that could have happened to me. Now, before Michelle got home, Darren decided that was it. He was leaving her. Then once she was home, he confronted her with the bill and also with what Kathy Cowled had told him. She just denied it all and told him to pack his bags and get out, but he was already going. It was difficult and emotional for him to leave the children behind, though. But with hindsight on many different levels... He realized that it was one of the biggest mistakes to leave and not take the kids with him. He really should have stayed and told Michelle to leave. You think? But I don't know if she would have. Well, she probably wouldn't have. She said, no, I'm not going to leave. But, you know, he did leave those kids in a mess. Yeah, he did. So Darren went to stay with his parents, and he made an appointment with Kevin to discuss his future with Bow Repairs, because he couldn't handle Kevin anymore as his boss. But the only job was offered to him was manager at Goodyear Modbury, which was a store still under Kevin's control. Then another manager offered him a position as a store man at Wingfield, which was the same pay until something more suitable came up. And while Darren was grateful for the offer, he decided he would have to remain at Elizabeth until he could find something else that suited him. 
he immediately began applying for other jobs outside bull repairs. Now, I would have taken that job. Well, maybe he didn't want to be away from his kids. Now, Michelle celebrated Darren's departure by arranging another rendezvous with Kevin. <laughs> so they're booking into a room under her maiden name. Now, this was at 8.50 a.m. And after a day of room service, sex, and scotch, they checked out at 4.18 p.m. Now, there was another tryst on January 25th at the Novotel in Adelaide, where the couple also enjoyed two chicken schnitzel specials. <laughs> but the regular, I just have to laugh. I'm sorry. But the regular hotel sex was expensive, right? I, that's another thing, all the money that they're spending on this. And it wasn't enough to satisfy their need for thrills. So mechanic Corey Bayless says it was around this time, January 2001, when he witnessed Michelle and Kevin's public sex show at the Roy Amer Reserve in Oakton. So right outdoors. Out there. Outdoors. Yeah. Nothing better than outdoor sex. Right out in the open there. Right. Now, they're also <laughs> enjoying many long lunches at the Hampstead Hotel, so they hadn't totally given up on hotel trysts. No, but I mean, I think a lot of these hotel drinking things are like the hotel bar. Right. Yeah. Now, barmaid Fiona Hughes later told police that a tall, fat, bald man with a mustache and a stocky blonde woman... <laughs> describes him nicely, frequented the hotel three or four days a week from December 2000 to July 2001. So these are regular bar flies. Holy cow. They were sometimes staying as long as four hours. Kevin would arrive first, order two drinks. Michelle would join him soon after, each time in the same booth in the saloon bar. They rarely ate, and if they did, it was only a basket of chips. They would each drink eight scotches and Coke, and Kevin would pay the bill as sixty, seventy dollars with his credit card. But there wasn't anything discreet about their behavior. Well, no. Now, Fiona told police they were very friendly and affectionate to each other. They would kiss and touch under the table. They would be half lying and half sitting on the seats. <laughs> Sometimes it was embarrassing to the staff and the patrons. I bet it was. Patrons would often move and sit at different table away from them, and they would, of course, make comments. She said she once heard him say that he loved her, and on a couple of occasions they had some minor arguments. She would either sit there in tears or walk out of the place. Now, here we got this poor wife, Carolyn, who was a very private woman by nature, and she'd done a really remarkable job keeping her feelings about Kevin's behavior under wraps. Yeah, but I don't know if that's really a positive thing might well, be better to speak up and get out of it, but I can see where she was coming from. I can too. However, the cost of the hotel rooms, the scotch, the gold chains, was quickly adding up. While she had no proof of where the money was going, she was afraid that Kevin's reckless spending behavior was pushing the family to the brink of financial ruin. Now, in July 2000, their property power account had a debit balance of 126000 and within the next year, it was over 150000 So he had been using their mortgage account to pay off his reckless spending on the MasterCard. So, yeah. wow. So that's really circling the drain, isn't it? Yep. So instead of paying down the mortgage, you're paying up the mortgage. Right, right. Now, Bob Brooks, who is a member of the Semaphore Surf Life Saving Club, considered the Matthews family to be close friends. He received a phone call from Carolyn at 10 p.m. Saturday, February 3, 2001. He later told police that Carolyn was upset and said that things were not very good between her and Kevin. She had no idea where Kevin was. Well, sure she did. She just didn't know where the two of them were. But she, well, yeah. she knew he was with Michelle. Well, but was she really in touch with that feeling? I think she was still had some denial. No. Nah. Kevin was sending her text messages telling her wanted out he wasn't coming back. Now, Bob reassured Carolyn that Kevin was probably drunk somewhere, <laughs> right, and that things would probably sort themselves out in the next few days. I bet he was drunk somewhere, though. Well, that's a good thought. He sent Kevin a text asking him to call him, but he never did. So, you know, Dick, everyone thinks they'd be a good detective, but how do you know? Check out Hunt a Killer. It's the first ever interactive investigation delivered straight to your door every month. You can be like Joe Kenda minus the 1970s wardrobe and the hard-boiled exterior. 
log into huntakiller.com and apply for membership. They only accept 200 members per day. Once you're accepted, you'll receive an invitation with a private link to complete your registration. My, my. Well, well, well. Your first episode ships that very first day with no shipping charges. You'll receive clues, correspondence, and physical items that put you into the mind of a serial killer. Then it's your job to decipher and investigate to unravel the case. Hunt a Killer has been featured in BuzzFeed, Fast Company, and The Washington Post. Hell, the editors of Bustle are writing monthly about their journey. Hunt a Killer is building an inside community of hunters where members communicate in a private Facebook group. Like tens of thousands of hunters, I'm a member. If investigating isn't your thing, you probably know a crime geek who would love this as a gift. Best of all, to help support our show, Hunt a Killer is offering 10% a 10% discount for our listeners. Just go to www.huntakiller.com and use the code BREWERY to get 10% off. Today's show is also brought to you by Audible. Audible has the best audiobook performances, an unmatched selection, and the most exclusive content. We love Audible. In fact, we have three accounts, one for me, one for you, and one for Tiger Grabber Podcasts. My latest Audible find is Into the Water by Paula Hawkins. Paula Hawkins wrote The Girl on the Train, which was excellent. And this one is just as good. Actually, it's probably better. I think I like it a little bit better. This book has kept my commutes and house cleaning interesting. If you listen to Into the Water on Audible, you'll experience things like hair raising on the back of your neck or even goosebumps. It's not only excellent writing, but the performance is really engrossing. With an Audible performance so powerful, you can feel the suspense wherever you are. Start a 30-day trial now and your first Audible book is free. You can learn more at audible.com slash brewery. That's audible.com slash B-R-E-W-E-R-Y. The next day, Bob went to the Matthews home and drove a tired and upset Carolyn and her boys to a surf life-saving carnival at Gulwa. After leaving the boys at the beach, he returned to the car park to talk to Carolyn, who was initially hesitant. But she soon admitted Kevin had maxed out their credit card and there was no money in their bank account. So she had no money, and she was afraid they'd be unable to make their mortgage payment, which was due just a couple days from there. Kevin had also been threatening suicide. She explained that Kevin had put a lock on his phone so she couldn't use it or see any of his messages. Now, this astounded Bob. Sure. He's a normal guy. Yeah. He gave Carolyn $50 so she could buy lunch for the boys, who knew nothing of the situation. Yvonne, Carolyn's mother, was on the beach that day. But Carolyn, who couldn't bear to see her, remained in the car park. So that's pretty tough. You can't even talk to your own mom. She's probably so embarrassed, don't you think? Well, I would be. Probably. Now, the carnival finished early due to bad weather, and they drove back to Adelaide. Kevin still wasn't home when they arrived. Bob told Carolyn he would try to get some money for her from the Surf's Life Saving Club. So he drove to the club to see the president, Peter Campaign, about the money. Kevin and Carolyn had lent the club a thousand dollars a few years before towards a building fund. So with interest, the club actually owed them about thirteen hundred dollars. Peter Campaign, who was also a long-standing friend of the Matthews family, agreed to repay the loan so that Carolyn could meet her mortgage payment. That evening, Carolyn made an excuse to leave the house and drove to the club where the money was removed and handed over to her. Carolyn begged Bob not to tell Kevin about the money. She was hoping Kevin would sort out their finances and she wouldn't need to use it. Now, she later told him that Kevin had paid the home loan and that she had told him about the money from the club. I wonder if that's true. I was just going to say, I don't know. But Bob Brooks did tell the police that Carolyn called him at home and confided that someone had told her that Kevin was having an affair. And, of course, he knew that the affair was with one of his employees' wives, which would have been Michelle, of course. Of course. Yeah. Who else? Right. So, Darren Burgess immediately hit some hurdles trying to be a good father to these kids that he left behind with Michelle. She'd make arrangements to drop the kids off to see him, and then she'd cancel or postpone, so it must have had an impact on them. Yeah, so he said, two weeks after I left, I went back to speak to Michelle. Fool. 
Well, he has to deal with her. He has kids. I think uh, you're way too hard on this guy. I was missing the kids badly. Some might say I went to reconcile, but I really went to satisfy myself that I had made a tough but correct decision to leave Michelle. In my mind, I knew there would be dire consequences for my children. Michelle was a selfish person, and she would not look after them properly. With what was going on, I knew she would risk their safety for her pleasure. After seeing her and speaking with her, I was satisfied it was all over, and now I could move on with my life. In one way, I was devastated for the sake of the kids, but happy to escape life with Michelle. So, so if I... she's such a crappy mother, and he's worried about their safety, he should go to the magistrate or somebody and apply for custody of the kids. But you know how hard that is for a father to get custody? Well, I don't know. I think it's tough. And okay. she does, you know, I just think that's tough because he's working all day and she's home with the kids. So it's hard to get the kids away from their mother if their mother's home, unless he had evidence of her behavior. Well, they do. Well, that's kind of hard to prove that kind of thing. We have eyewitnesses. We have hotel credit card payments. Oh, but you're just, that's unrealistic. She'd have to get a lawyer and, you know, come on, let's be realistic here. Uh, I, I think you're asking way too much of this guy. Well, because I... I don't like them very much, I guess. I guess I, not. I would have tried to get custody of the kids. I think it, sure, and he might, but that would really take time. That wouldn't be an immediate thing. I realize that. Okay. But what's best for the kids? Sure, and maybe he would have over time because events happen. Give him a break here. Has no self-esteem or something. That might be it. Now, on February 25th, in another conversation, Michelle concocted another fantasy. She claimed she had cervical cancer and wanted to get back together with Darren. Now, she told him she had cancer and that she had 6 to 12 months to live, and she wanted to get back together with him so that their children could have a family. Then she said she'd spent the last three days at a health farm. But Darren's father, Lindsay, decided it was time that he intervened with the situation. He later told police that a month after Darren came to stay, he had confided to his parents that Michelle had been having an affair with Kevin while they had still been together. He told them about the mobile phone account with dozens of calls to Kevin and the call from Julie warning him of the affair. Now, Lindsay was furious and decided that he was going to get to the bottom of it all, so he was going to interrogate Kevin. So on Sunday, February 25th, 2001, he went to the Matthews home and spoke to Kevin in their yard. And predictably, Kevin denied the affair and explained to Lindsay about the night Michelle had claimed to be stabbed. So while he was recounting this story, Carolyn came out and stood next to Kevin. And Lindsay asked her what she thought of the situation. And she shrugged and said, I don't know, I think we have a perfect marriage. So that blows me away. Why would she yeah. say that? That's crazy. <laughs> Beggar's description. Well, she's like trying to defend him, but I don't understand why. I don't have any idea why. Now, and Lindsay later told police that Kevin said he wanted all four of them, himself, Carolyn, Darren, and Michelle, to sit down and talk this affair thing over. Carolyn also confirmed this and did not seem shocked to hear this information about Kevin. But I always thought she was a calm sort of person. Well, yeah, maybe she was drugged or something. I don't know. <laughs> The only thing she was doing was pacing up and down a bit. I spoke to them for about half an hour. Early in the conversation, I felt that Kevin was lying because he wouldn't look at me. I left telling Kevin I'd make up my mind later about whether or not he was involved with Michelle. But I did tell him I thought he was having an affair. I shook his hand when I left and said goodbye to Carolyn. So I'd like to know what he thought this accomplished. I don't know. I mean, he's trying, I guess. Trying okay. to figure things out. He probably doesn't know how bad it is. So after ending what was undoubtedly the worst relationship of his life, Darren Burgess's luck finally changed. After he was watching a Port Adelaide game and enjoying a few beers with some mates, he was feeling better than he had in a long time. Yeah, he was loose from the liquor. Yeah, and then he joked back and forth with a friend of one of his mate's wives, and they kind of hit it off. So he called her and talked to her and uh, ended up having this relationship. Her name's Kathy Morton, and over 10 years later, they're still together. Now, Michelle was oblivious to the fact that the, men, that the man she had trapped was a good one. 
referring to Darren, but Kathy instantly recognized that Darren was a good guy and she fell in love with him. So in the first few months, their relationship was put to the ultimate test as they dealt with Michelle and all this stuff going on, but they stuck it out. So from the moment Darren informed Michelle of his new relationship, though, she became jealous and lashed out. Now, he informed her that Kathy would be attending their son's soccer match and asked that she be polite when he introduced them, but she wanted no part of it. She wouldn't even be cooperative. So here she is. She gets out of the relationship, gets everything she wants, and she's still being awful. She was. So on March 5th, Darren made a diary note stating, told Michelle I hate her. <laughs> followed two days later by, I need to sort out Kevin, otherwise I'll quit my job. Well, he did quit. He did, but the supervisor, who was the guy above Kevin, refused to accept it. Yeah. So when he called that supervisor and spoke to her, he decided he wasn't going to leave. Right. Now. Yeah, so the, the supervisor's talking about how uh, Darren hadn't given her the full story because he hadn't mentioned that he got a new girlfriend. And he said, that's irrelevant to the situation. Well, sure it is. It's about me working for Kevin after he had an affair with my wife. And that's the big thing. That's quite reasonable. Yeah. So she told Darren he no longer had to communicate with Kevin, and he should instead contact her for any work matters. But then a week later, she lost her job. So soon after that, a new retail sales manager, Stephen Gower, was appointed, and he took a tour of the stores. Now, Darren found himself standing in front of his store with his new boss and Kevin. Kevin left as soon as he could. Darren was up front and explained the situation to Gower, but he had doubts that his story was believed. He had a point to prove, so he gave Michelle's phone number to Gower and suggested he cross-reference Kevin's phone records. Now, Darren said Gower called him a few days later and said, Well, I can tell you that I know your wife's number very well, and I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> and there were more and more stories going around Beau Repairs about Kevin and Michelle. One that she was caught giving him a head job in the car. I think Gower rang around a few of the managers, which is included Darren, and asked what we thought about Kevin's performance. I was a bit biased, of course, said Darren, but I told him we didn't have any sales meetings. We hardly ever hear from him or see him. So Gower who is now Kevin Matthews' immediate supervisor, reprimanded him in an email dated March 26th over the use of his corporate American Express card. He later told police he had advised Kevin that he'd signed off on his expenses for the month. Kevin needed to be more specific with details from thence on. He also noted that Kevin's entertainment expenses were excessive and needed to be kept to a minimum. Well, yeah, he's in a hotel every couple days. Yeah, now while all this is going on, Darren discovers that Michelle had yet another new man in her life. She'd met this guy named Jason from Perth on the internet, and he came to stay with her for a couple of weeks. Darren actually saw him at his son's soccer match once. So, so Darren's out of the picture, or leaving the picture. Michelle is still going hot and heavy with Kevin, but she's got a new guy lined up. Yeah. Had a girl, Michelle. So she goes to Rebel Ford to buy another car. But Michael Wellens, who has a working relationship with Darren and occasionally socialized with him, was reluctant to sell her a car. Michelle told him she'd split up with Darren and needed to trade in, trade in her Nissan so she could get her own car. Now, Wellens knew that Darren was the co-owner of the Pintera that she was going to trade in. And he rang him later in the day to confirm that he would need to sort things out with Michelle before she could get her new car. Michelle looked around the yard and found a 1990 Toyota Seca. And after a test drive, she agreed to buy that one for $9,800. So once Darren had give permi given permission for her to trade in the Nissan Pintera, Michelle made an application to a finance company, which was approved, which is strange because she had no income. And then arrangements were made for her to get that vehicle. Yeah, I wonder how that happens. I don't know. I've been thinking with Darren's credit, perhaps. Yeah. Now it must have been. They must have been looking at his money. I don't know. Because she had no income. Yeah, but they're divorced or divorcing. Well, they're still together. All that together. Still married. Yeah, that's true. 
Now, in April, Darren and Michelle's estrangement took a big turn for the worse. Darren says he and Michelle were getting on relatively well up until just before Easter 2001. She'd been allowing him to see the kids. Now, he said he made a point to her when they broke up that for the sake of the kids, they'd be on friendly terms. He didn't want them stuck in the middle of two fighting parents, but that changed when he got the girlfriend, Kathy. Now, the custody arrangement with the children was informal, and they would stay with Darren every second weekend, and he took them out to dinner every other week, but now he was forced to take court action in order to see them at all. So he's granted visits and allowed to have dinner with them. But Michelle believed Darren shouldn't have the kids at all when Kathy had her boys because she didn't want the boys mixing together. Yeah, but by the same token, Darren didn't want this new guy, Jason, hanging around his kids well, sure. with Michelle. I don't so blame it's, him. So it's kind of a standoff. Yeah, so one Tuesday night in late March, as Darren was dropping the kids at home and saying goodbye to them out front, Michelle snatched his phone from his hand, ran inside, and locked the door. Now, after getting Kathy's phone number, she returned the phone. So Darren remembers that he called Kathy right away to tell her what had happened and to expect that Michelle would be calling her. Then he made a note in his diary that Michelle had called and had asked him what he was doing with such a bitch. Now, she said that he was dead and that Kathy was dead, and she said, that's a promise, not a threat. A sweetheart. So Kathy Morton later gave police a detailed account of the incident, which occurred on a Sunday prior to Easter in 2001. She was with Darren. They're driving home. Darren's mobile rang, and when he answered it, Kathy could hear Michelle screaming at him. She's dead. You're dead. I'll kill you both. Darren hung up, and shortly after, he received a text message which read, Please call. No more fighting. A second, less conciliatory (laughs) message read, I know where she lives. It's a promise, not a threat. So she's a really messed up human being, that Michelle. Well, yeah, we've known that. Now the next day, Kathy's on the train on her way home from work when Michelle called her cell phone. And Kathy tried to discuss the children because she was hoping that Darren could have them for Easter so that they could meet her children. But Michelle began screaming at her abusively, called her a slut, a whore, and a troll. Kathy yelled back, If you're going to call me abusive names, at least get it right. It's a trollop, not a troll. I don't live under a bridge. And then she hung up. (laughs) Good call. So the women sitting next to her on the train, though, had heard this exchange, and they gave her dirty looks. Now, after that, Michelle immediately sent a nasty text message saying, You tell Darren he will not be getting sex this Tuesday night when he drops off the children. I'm really pissed and angry. So she's trying to make Kathy think that Darren still has sex with her. Right. But she must know better. But she didn't, I guess, because she called his parents to check and see. And they assured her that nothing was going on with them anymore. Darren's father told her that she was actually the best thing that had happened to Darren. Yeah, so that very evening, Darren and Kathy went to the Christie's Beach police station and got the paperwork going for a restraining order against Michelle. So we're finally taking some proactive steps here. Yeah, I think this girlfriend was good for Darren. Yeah. Gave him a little more chutzpah. Yeah, except that the officer at the police station laughed at him. It made him feel insignificant. He said to me, you want a restraining order against your ex-wife? Well, and they should have gone ahead with it, but they didn't. But they didn't because he didn't want to be called a wuss. Yeah, but they were really concerned. I mean, she had threatened their lives. Well, yeah. Now, there was another separate nasty spat that broke out over a recurrent health issue of one of the children. The situation culminated in a meeting between Michelle and an officer from Family and Youth Services who commented that Michelle presented as a loving mother who was sensitive to the needs of the children. But in a related incident, an anonymous female complainant, which was certainly Michelle, rang Family and Youth Services and reported Darren. And this woman told them that he was deliberately not giving the medication to the child. Right. And the caller also said Darren had his driver's license suspended for drinking and driving. But he had been regularly drinking and driving with the children in the car and made them refer to their mother as bitch. Yeah, now the person who took that call, though, had some real doubts about if that was a legitimate concern. Well, yeah. Yeah, so then that Darren's father, Lindsay, got his uh, nose into it again. Yeah, he just can't stay away. He was really helpful the first time. 
Yeah, so he goes and confronts Kevin at work. And he told him that the verdict was in and he was guilty of having an affair. But Kevin still denied it. And Lindsay warned him that it was having a bad effect on the children. But Kevin said, uh, nope, it's not real, it's not going on, and Lindsay left. So I think Lindsay should stop. But he then called Carolyn again and told her he wasn't trying to harass her, but he did believe that they were still having an affair. But all she did was she said thank you and hung up. Yeah. But you know... Kevin kept denying that he was having an affair with Michelle. He did. Uh, until there was so much evidence to the contrary that he had to confess. But even down the road, as, as we'll see, when all the bad stuff happened, he kept saying, nope, nope, never had an affair with her. I know, which is really kind of ridiculous. So over Easter, the Matthews family went to stay at a shack on the River Murray at Scott Creek near Morgan, this belonged to Valerie Rismondo, a close friend of Carolyn's who she'd met through the boys that attended the same school. Valerie told police that she talked to Carolyn throughout the weekend, but the focus was mainly on the children. You know, Carolyn had mentioned she was worried about Kevin's drinking and that they'd received a series of odd phone calls between October and Christmas. She also mentioned to Valerie that she had asked Kevin if he was having an affair, and he said, don't be so stupid. So a petty criminal named David Key, was released from a South Australian prison in April. Now, Key had no connection whatsoever to Michelle Burgess or Kevin Matthews. But within just a few weeks, a series of bizarre circumstances are going to make him a player in Michelle's dark plans. Kind of the perfect storm. Yeah, kind of is. It really is. Now, Michelle booked into a cabin at the Adelaide Beachfront Tourist Park in late April under her maiden name, and notably she'd had her children with her. And it's not known if Kevin Matthews joined them, but on the morning she checked out, Kevin Matthews had checked out of a room at the South Park Adelaide also. Now, one man was not enough for Michelle Burgess, though. She had Jason from Perth, and then when he left, she started scanning the personal ads looking for somebody else. So in early June of 2001, a man we're going to call Stephen placed two separate ads several weeks apart in the Talking Friends section of the paper. About 15 women left messages, including a woman who described herself as 26 with blonde hair, blue eyes, children, recently separated, who was looking for friendship. So Stephen called the woman and they immediately hit it off. They spoke on the phone for a couple of hours and he arranged to meet her at a cafe. Now, this was Michelle, of course, and she explained to him that she'd split up with her husband, Darren, earlier in the year, and they were in the process of selling their house. So their conversation flowed smoothly, and while Stephen explained he would be meeting other women, Michelle was happy to give him her phone number. Yeah, so Stephen said that they became friends, she seemed intelligent, but it didn't become a romance, so that's surprising. He said she drank a lot and would call him to talk a lot about her husband, her kids, but she also would talk about wanting to get rid of her husband. She didn't say she wanted to kill him, but she just wanted him out of her life somehow. He would try and calm her down, and she would call him early in the morning or in the evening. They'd talk on the phone for hours. Now, she told Stephen she had a couple of guys who were friends with benefits, but he wasn't interested in that. And she didn't tell him any of the names. But she would complain about life and get drunk and call him. They went out to dinner a couple of times, and he even had her to his house for dinner once. Now, she made up stories to him about her husband beating her up, putting her up against the wall, and strangling her in front of the kids. And even Stephen, who didn't know Darren, didn't believe these stories. Yeah, Stephen sounds like he was lucky not oh, to get more involved with her. Yeah. Or smart. Yeah. Now, meanwhile, the constant rumors, his poor performance and excessive spending on the company credit card... All this finally brought Kevin Matthews' corporate career to a screeching halt. Stephen Gower flew to Adelaide in June 2001. Gower told Kevin his performance was unsatisfactory. Branch managers had advised him that they were rarely seen by him. They couldn't contact him at work or on his mobile. When they did, he was very aggressive and off-putting. Kevin had left his boss with no other choice. He'd be demoted to branch manager at Port Adelaide. Now, Gower didn't mention that the other reason for the demotion was the irrefutable evidence of Kevin's affair with Michelle Burgess. Right, so... Irrefutable. 
Yeah. Despite Kevin's continued denial. Well, so then he started in a lower position. And by coincidence, Darren Bland, with whom Michelle had also had an affair earlier, had been managing that store, but he had quit. So he started work at the Altratune store just across the driveway from Kevin's new workplace. They were both smokers, so their paths would cross outside. Bland would later tell police that he saw Kevin out the back or in the driveway using his mobile phone for up to a couple of hours throughout the day. He had heard the rumors about Kevin and Michelle, and he was concerned because he liked Kevin and didn't want to see him hurt by her. So he approached him on several occasions and questioned him about Michelle. Kevin insisted there was no affair, but Darren Bland made his point. He said Michelle was nothing but trouble and Kevin should definitely steer clear of her. He is drinking, he being Kevin, he is drinking triple scotches at 10.30 in the morning. He was even reprimanded for this. So this guy's a mess. He is. He's going down the tubes fast. I mean, he really needed to be put in some kind of rehab, but I guess he wasn't open to it. You have to want to do that. I guess. So Kevin had gone from regional manager to being just one of the guys, and he wasn't comfortable with that. Then we have all these rumors and innuendo. He's demoted. It's not looking good. Now, the kids, Kenny, Shane, and Daniel Matthews, also knew something was seriously amiss with their parents' marriage. But they were shielded from the truth as much as possible by Carolyn. So Shane remembers that the word divorce was never mentioned, but the threat hung heavily over the household. He noticed that his father was going on more trips and that he stayed at work a lot more often. Now, the first time he realized something was really wrong was when he was at one of his football games. His game was over, and he went to sit in the car. It was his dad's work car, and there was a tape player, dictaphone type thing in the car, and he turned it on, and he heard his dad's voice arguing with someone else. Now, his dad was saying something about two kids, and it was obviously something about Darren and Michelle and their two kids. Shane was confused by it and just put it out of his mind. I mean, he's just a kid. (laughs) That's right. But the strain was starting to show on this usually happy and carefree Carolyn. Anne McKenzie, a mother whose children went to the same swimming center as the Matthews boys, noted that Carolyn's distress was really showing when she came to pick up her kids from swimming in the second week of June. She looked really tired, like she hadn't slept. Now Anne actually commented on her appearance, and Carolyn told her she'd been up all night and was really upset. And Carolyn called her a week later to let her know that she'd changed their phone number to an unlisted number. Now, Anne asked if it had anything to do with what had happened the week before, and Carolyn said it did. They'd been getting threatening phone calls, and they'd even gotten a death threat. So Anne asked if she knew who was doing it. And Carolyn said she didn't know, but whoever was making the calls knew details of their life. And Anne asked if she'd reported the calls to the police, but Carolyn told her, The police had said there was nothing they could do unless there were three or more calls in a week. So that was a weird answer because it sounds like they were getting more than that. It does, and and it makes me think that she hadn't reported anything to the police. Yeah, I know. Because that just sounds made up. Well, while Carolyn's struggling to feed her family and begging for money to pay the mortgage, Kevin's corporate American Express was still valid. And on June 15th, he used it to pay for $60 worth of flowers and chocolates delivered to Liz. Now, Elizabeth was Michelle's middle name. So they were delivered to her, and the note said, Liz, love you more. I'm touched. Yeah. So they'd been house hunting for Michelle because the Burgess's home had finally been sold. A Century 21 property manager later told police that Michelle became a tenant at a villa in Craigmore on June 18th, 2001. Now the manager met Michelle at the property for an inspection the week before, and she was waiting at the house and saw Michelle arrive in one car and Kevin arrive in another. They embraced and kissed before they came into the house, and the manager asked if Kevin was going to be living at the property, but he said no. So now Michelle's got her own little love nest, and she's got a big check coming her way for the sale of the house. Yeah, but it wasn't enough because she didn't have any income and she didn't work. Right. So she might be making money from the house sale, but that's going to go pretty quickly. Right. Now she's just hating Carolyn more. She's focusing all her anger on Carolyn. Right. 
and Carolyn. I don't know why, but she's making phone calls warning Michelle to keep away from her and husband. Now, right. Michelle wanted what Carolyn had and was prepared to take it, it seems like. She was fantasizing constantly about her and Kevin having a life together if they could only get rid of Darren and Carolyn, but at the same time, she's sleeping with other guys. Right. Just amazing. So bizarre, yeah. Now, we're starting to talk, though, about doing away with people. Yeah, this More is where seriously. we're coming into the start the plot. Right. Now, Kathy Cowell, a mom who picked up her kids at the same school as Michelle, said that Michelle liked to show her pictures of her boyfriends. And one of these boyfriends was Kevin Matthews. Michelle bragged about having sex with Kevin in public places like the park and the alley behind his store. Now, every day she revealed more things. She told of long alcohol-filled lunches and often showed up at the school with alcohol on her breath. Yeah, but by March, Michelle was coming to the school crying and upset. Carolyn had found out about the affair, and Michelle said that Carolyn was harassing her, and she wanted her out of the way and six foot underground. Now, Michelle repeatedly threatened Carolyn over the next few weeks, but Kathy thought she was just blowing off steam. Michelle also started saying she wanted to get rid of Darren. She said if Kathy knew anyone who would do it, suggesting an accident while the kids weren't with them to let her know. But instead of going to the police, and this is baffling, Kathy decides to help her. This is really baffling, because the impression I get from doing the reading, they were acquaintances, but not friends. Right. And, and certainly not someone you'd confide in uh, who could find you a hitman. Well, and she seemed but, like she was a normal mom, so yeah, what happened? I don't know. I think there's more to this story. Yeah. But anyway, Kathy said, yeah, yeah she, she knows somebody. Yeah. She, she told Michelle about her brother David, saying he might be able to help. Right. So and, she and called. And now we're back to David Key, who we talked about a little while ago being released from prison. So Kathy called her brother, David, the next day, explained Michelle's dilemma. David doesn't hesitate. He told his sister he knew someone who could help her. And he asked for more information about Carolyn and Darren. So we're trying for a double hit. Yes. He sounded intrigued, even excited by the ideas. Yeah, well, David Key had only been out of jail for about two months when he met Michelle. He was looking for work, and his sister called him saying she had a job for him. Now, the idea that this job was that of a contract killer didn't seem to faze him, although he hadn't done that before. But David had kind of a low IQ, and he was pretty much illiterate. He was also predisposed to hostility and anger. Additionally, David was an alcoholic with amphetamine dependence, chronic post-traumatic stress disorder, and antisocial personality disorder. So he was a bit of a time bomb. Oh, well, that's an understatement. But I guess he's the perfect hitman. Well, perfect to who? I don't know. For your purposes. You but the, the problem with that is that he's not going to be able to be silent about it. Well, of course not. He doesn't know what he's doing. No. He's just a, a problem. I mean, But if you want someone to kill somebody, David's your guy. Well, he'll do it, but he's not going to help you get away with it. Well. So he's this wiry guy with a shaved head and a goatee. And he's got this huge appetite for drugs, and he's always ready to fight. Yeah, he's just the kind of guy who you'd cross the street to avoid go, going up against. Yes. So at the school one morning, Michelle gave Kathy a piece of paper with a photo of Carolyn Matthews taped to it. And she explained that Kevin had written down the detailed information about Carolyn on the paper. So Michelle explained to Kathy, I told Kevin we found someone to do the job. And on the paper, Kevin had listed his wife's personal details, her date of birth, home address, work address, the time she left for work, the time she arrived home, her mobile phone number, and her work number. So Kathy gave the paper to David, telling him how Carolyn had been harassing Michelle and needed him to get rid of her. So now David's got a purpose in life. Seems like it, yeah. Instead of drinking and smoking dope and stuff. Well, not instead of, in addition to. Okay, that's true. So Michelle had offered some tips on the back of an old envelope. Look like a car accident, be alone, one done this week, one by the next week. So if all went according to plan, she said to Kathy, one of them would be dead by Friday. Now, a few days later, Michelle gave Kathy a second murder contract. 
This one was in her handwriting, and there's a photo of Darren Burgess attached to it. So Kathy told David that Darren was Michelle's ex-husband, and she wanted him dead. She didn't want him to get custody of the kids. She wanted him gone. Kathy drove David to the school in the morning, introduced him to Michelle. She gave him various scenarios for the murders, and he said, Don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. Yeah, so he gave Michelle a price of $50,000, $25,000 each. And he looked Michelle up and down, finding her attractive, thinking he might get lucky. Now, Michelle said that Kevin was a good friend who had problems in his marriage and wanted out. She said that she was going to pay for Carolyn to be killed, and Kevin was going to pay for Darren to be killed. So this is like a Dutch treat, double it's killing. weird, isn't it? Yeah. So David was really excited by all this. He felt like he was this professional hitman. He looked at the contracts over and over again, devising a plan. And Kevin withdrew $1,500 from the strained mortgage account and gave it to Michelle. Now, Michelle gave the money to David as a down payment. He planned to use the cash to buy a gun with a silencer, but then he ended up spending it all on pot and speed. <laughs> He's got a well-thought-out plan here. Right. So he hung out with this guy named George, who he thought could get him a gun. And then he begins bringing Michelle to George's house. So they would sit on George's couch, making out and smoking pot, and by this time, Michelle was having sex with David. So he really wanted nothing more than to make Michelle happy. Now, I'm just going to interject one time here. We've seen pictures of Michelle. Yeah. She is not someone who you'd want to have sex with. Well, some people would. But she must have some magnetism or something, because she's getting tons of action. Yes. Well, plus she's not picky, so... Well, okay. That doesn't hurt. So, and David has a lot of issues. He didn't have an ideal childhood. Father was a violent alcoholic. He adored his mother, but she could also be violent. He was close to his mother and thought he was her favorite over his three sisters. He had no diagnosed developmental issues as a child, but he had severe asthma, was hospitalized frequently. The family moved a lot because of their poverty. His father worked as a laborer and a truck driver. He was beaten regularly by his father, David was. And he was also violent to the three sisters and his mother. The father was, The father yeah. was. He was assaulting them with belts and fists. David often ran away from home and slept under a local bridge. So he had a really shitty childhood. He did, and when he was 16, his father held a knife to his throat. And he beat his father until he was unconscious. He was arrested and charged with assault, but then his father dropped the charges. Now, David's sisters were worried about David. They told him that if he didn't change the way he was, he was going to end up in prison for murder. Now, David was expelled from school in year 10 after a schoolyard brawl. A teacher had intervened, and David had gone ahead and attacked the teacher. So after that, he traveled for short-term laboring jobs and otherwise survived on the dole. But in spite of all of his issues, David was confident with his talent with the ladies. He had a history of sexual promiscuity. He was in a relationship with a woman for several years, and they had three children, but they never lived together. Now, he didn't have relationships with any of his children, and the mother eventually married another man. He was convicted of armed robbery back in 1993, he was using amphetamines intravenously and smoking large amounts of weed. Now, his robbery victim was his next-door neighbor. David had held a knife to his throat. He got $3,000 from him and was sentenced to six years in prison. But after he was released, he breached parole three times and returned to custody each time for several months. He just can't stay on the straight and narrow. No. Now, after David and Michelle's initial meeting, Michelle would call him up to five times a day and they began to meet regularly. One night, drunk, she invited David to her house. And after she sent her kids to bed, she and David ended up having sex on the living room floor. So that's how it started. Then he was pretty much moved in, spending at least three to four nights a week at her house. He thought he'd hit the jackpot. Now Michelle had sex with him once or twice a day, and it didn't matter where they were. They did it in the house, in the car, even outside. Yep. 
So in July, when Michelle received a check for $33,000 from the sale of her and Darren's home, she was pretty happy about that. Because Darren had a job and only had the kids part-time, he only got $1,800. Right. And meanwhile, Carolyn's confiding to a friend about her problems with Kevin and their growing financial problems. You know, Kevin's drinking heavily. He's continuing his affair with Michelle. Carolyn had found records of jewelry purchases in their bank records, but she knew that Kevin hadn't given her any jewelry. Yeah, so David had started driving by Darren's work. He went into the shop and bought a battery as a cover for being there. And Darren was wary of him and really shocked to see that he was driving Michelle's car. David said that he'd bought the car for $9,000. But when Darren called Michelle, she admitted that she knew David. Darren was concerned, really, with the sort of people Michelle was hanging around with. He didn't want his children around these criminals. Right. And and this guy, David, looked like scary. some gangster. Scary guy. Very scary. So David bought a battery from Darren. He reported to Michelle afterwards that he had too many people around him to get him at work. So this was kind of a exploratory thing to see what he could do about Darren. Yeah. Checking him out. Michelle replied, well, just cut the brakes on Darren's car. But that's not a guarantee anyway. Well, no. And then, shockingly, David's the one that said, well, what if the kids are in the car? So he's the one talking sense there. Yeah. So they decided, okay, let's put off Darren and we'll concentrate on killing Carolyn first. So Darren had sent Carolyn a copy of the phone bill after highlighting the numerous calls between Kevin and Michelle. So Carolyn confronts Kevin at work, and his employees overheard an argument between the two. Must have been something. Yeah. So, July 12, 2001. Carolyn's up at 4.15 a.m., taking care of things around the house, getting the kids to swim practice. At 6.45, she arrives at Judith Roberts' home, where they work at their Bedspreads Plus business. Carolyn rarely confided about her personal problems, but that day she told Judith that Kevin had been demoted at work and the boys were driving her crazy. She told her that Kevin was having an affair and there'd been phone threats. Now their finances were strained and Kevin continued to spend irresponsibly. At the same time, Michelle Burgess and David Key were discussing how they were going to kill Carolyn Matthews. Now Michelle's children were in their bedrooms as David and Michelle went over this murder plot. And the kids were terrified of David. It doesn't sound like anybody's unafraid of David. No. He must have been some mean-looking bastard. But she's letting him drive her kids around and things. Yeah, and letting him stay at her house. Sure. She's had several men staying at the house. Yeah, David became the favorite. So around noontime... Michelle went to the bank and deposited her $33,000 check. She told David to wait in the car while she went into the bank. After that, they drove around drinking and driving. Kevin called Michelle's cell at 117, followed by another four calls between 229 and 340. And there was a total of 14 calls between Michelle and Kevin from 6 a.m. until 12.23 p.m. So the plot's really thickening up now. Sure is. So she tells David, David Gee, Kevin was losing the plot, and she needed to go and see him. She admitted that Kevin was stressing out and sending messages that he was going to kill himself. So she drove to Michelle's mother's house, dropped off the children. They're there at the house for about ten minutes. They each used the bathroom. David took that time to inject some more amphetamines. So he's getting himself really kind of hyped up on drugs, I think is the point there. Yeah. Now, at Kevin's work, David and Michelle don't go unnoticed, of course. David stood at the back of his car and gave everybody the eyeball, and he appeared like an angry guy. He was an angry guy. Yeah. Now, after talking to Kevin, Michelle told David that Carolyn had to be killed that day. And she said that Kevin would take the kids to the video store so that they could get her alone at home. Now, Michelle left Kevin at work at 525. Then Kevin Matthews called home. Shane answered. Kevin told him he was coming home to take him and his brothers to the video store. It was 540 when Kevin arrived and picked up the boys. 
Going to the video store was a big treat for the boys. If they were good during the day and didn't bother their mom at work, videos were their reward. Now, usually this was set up beforehand, but that day it was a surprise. Spur of the moment. Yeah. Because we're going to have your mother killed, so I need to get you guys out of the house. That's it, yeah. Unbelievably, it is it. Yeah, so on their way to the Matthews house, David and Michelle were yelling at each other about how the murder would happen and what would happen to them afterwards. David told her that she considered that she could spend the rest of her life in jail and never see her kids again. He felt like Michelle was going to do the killing. He told Michelle she was a bitch and a homewrecker. And Michelle says, the sooner she's dead, the better. Then Michelle, in turn, ridiculed David, telling him that a real criminal would kill her. He could prove he was a man go by going through with it. She told him that it was over between them if it didn't happen that night. So they're each trying to pump the other one up. Yeah, so the two get on the block where the Matthews house is, and they actually watch as Kevin Matthews drives away with the boys to the video store. And they walk towards the Matthews house. Now poor Carolyn, she's cleaning up the house and going to carry out the trash, and she's startled by Michelle in the doorway. And she's got this scary-looking guy with her. And he asks her, is your name Carolyn Matthews? So she says yes, and he shows her the murder contract with her picture that is written out by Kevin. And he says, is this your picture and your address? So Carolyn looks at this paper, and she hands it back to David. Michelle then, just out of nowhere, lunges forward and punches Carolyn right in the face. Carolyn stumbles back into the screen door, and she yelled at David to grab Carolyn and get her back inside. So, so Michelle's kind of taking charge here. Well, at this point. So they do that. They, they get her back into the house, and David pushes Carolyn into a kitchen chair. So Carolyn asked him what she had done wrong. Every time she tried to stand up, he pushed her back down into the chair. And during this time, Michelle's rummaging around in the kitchen drawers. So David grabs Carolyn's arm, pushes her into a corner, and Michelle's standing there with a kitchen knife in her hand. So she orders David to kill Carolyn. She says, if you want to be with me, you prove to me how much you love me. Kill her. If you don't kill her, you'll never see any payment, and you'll never see me again. I'll have you knocked. Yeah, so Carolyn must have been terrified. She was blocked into this tiny kitchen by these two crazy people. It's well, dark, raving mad. We'll never know exactly how it happened, but David took the knife from Michelle's hand and lunged at Carolyn. He stabbed her repeatedly. He stabbed her twice in the chest and once in the back before he went into a frenzy, stabbing at her again and again. At one point, Carolyn grabbed a frying pan and waved it like a shield in front of her chest. That's how the knife got bent, and Carolyn fell to the floor. So tell us a little bit about the wounds that she suffered. Well, the forensic pathologist found 41 separate injuries on Carolyn's body. The report said she had abrasions on her forehead, a knife wound on her cheek, bruising and swelling to her cheek, stab wounds to her forearm and wrist, sort of defensive wounds, stab wounds on her palm, stab wound to her back, and stab wounds, wounds to her chest, which penetrated her left lung. Now, the immediate cause of her death was the stab wounds to her chest. She had injuries to both lungs, which led to their collapse and bleeding into the chest cavity. The most significant wound involved the cutting of the pulmonary artery to the right lung, and another stab wound penetrated her heart. So these, these two things, the pulmonary artery wound and the heart injury, would lead to death very quickly from blood loss. Pulmonary artery comes off the right heart, and then it goes to the lungs and back to the heart, and it gets pumped out on the so left side of the... So it's a big one. Big vessel. Well, I think all you have to say about that is that cutting a pulmonary artery is a significant injury, that's, and you're that's not going to survive that. You'd have to be in an OR ready to go when it happened to save right. her. Yeah. Yeah. And then they also penetrated her heart. So that's another cause of sudden death. Yeah, so, and this was such a brutal attack. It's a horrible attack. Yeah. So, so the murder's over. 
and Carolyn's covered in their own blood lying on the kitchen floor. So David claimed that Michelle stood in the doorway as he stabbed Carolyn so she could avoid blood spatter. He grabbed a kitchen towel and mopped blood from his face and hands. He grabbed a knife, two other knives he'd seen Michelle touch, and the frying pan. He wiped the knives with a sock from the clothesline and left them next to the front path. When he got to the car, Michelle's in the passenger side laughing. David said it was a vicious cackling laugh. Then she said, well done, about time someone had enough balls to kill her. So she truly is evil. She is a mess. Now Kevin had started drinking early that afternoon, because he knew what was up. He was drinking a can of UDL, which I looked up and it's like a, like a beer can, but it's vodka and juice or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Or whiskey and Coke or something. I don't know. The only one I saw was vodka, but there could be some with scotch. I don't know. We don't have them here. Maybe no. one of our Australian listeners can fill us in on that. But they're, they're alcoholic drinks. Well, yeah, and he's drinking them as he's driving his kids to the video store. Yep. Now, he gave them $20 to get videos and waited for them in the car. They were only in that store for 15 minutes. So at 5.58 p.m., the computer at the video store recorded the boys' selections. Just as they left the shop, there was a three-second call from a public phone to Kevin's cell phone. So that's just long enough for her to tell him that the job is done. Sure. Call up. It's done. It's over. Boom. Right. So whatever was going on in Kevin's mind, his boys didn't notice anything unusual at that point. No, but these are rambunctious young boys yeah, getting their they're, videos. They're only they're not... interested in getting their videos. Yeah, they're not really paying attention to that. No. So after Michelle and David picked up Michelle's kids at her mother's house, they returned to Michelle's place. She threw all the clothes they'd been wearing into the washing machine. She later took her jacket to the cleaners. David took a shower. Then he worked on cleaning out and wiping down the car. Well, you can't do that enough to erase every trace. No, I'm sure he didn't. But, you know, he's and pretty hyped didn't. up no, on they, the speed. They found Carolyn's blood in her car. Yeah. So when Kevin and the boys return home from the video store, the boys are excited to watch their videos, and Kevin walks in behind them into the house. Shane noticed that the recycling bin was tipped on the front lawn, and there was a frying pan out there, too. Shane wasn't too surprised. His parents had been on the rocks and fighting, and he thinks maybe Mom had tossed things around in anger. So Kenny was the first to walk into the kitchen, and he saw his mom lying on her back with her eyes open. The dishwasher was open, and there was blood around her mouth, so he thought she must have tripped and bumped her head. Then Kevin came in, and his own son would say he gave kind of a fake yell. He gave Shane the phone, and he got on the floor to start resuscitation and help with their mom. Now, there was an incredible amount of blood in that kitchen. Well, yeah, she had been stabbed multiple times, and a couple of those wounds had nicked pulmonary artery in the heart, so there must have been a ton of blood. Sure, yeah. So Shane called triple zero, which I guess is the 911 yeah. in Australia. Right. Kevin was on the ground beside Carolyn, starting resuscitation. She had no pulse. So at first Shane saw the cut on her wrist and thought she'd killed herself. The ambulance arrives, Kevin collapses, and then there's another ambulance called for him. Yeah, so they interviewed Kevin that night at the police station. And when he was asked about his relationship with Carolyn, he said that they were just fine. He admitted that there was some stress with the kids and some minor disputes about finances, but nothing out of the ordinary. He said he didn't know how she died, but that he had tried to resuscitate her. Now, he denied the affair again, but he said that he'd been accused by Darren of having an affair with his wife. So I guess they just generally, something they would ask any husband, were you having an affair? Yeah, were there any marital difficulties? Right, and he said no, but he had been accused by Darren. Yeah, so he's sort of covering that, because it's going to get down to people are going to say sure. he was having an affair, and he can say, oh, I, I mentioned that, that somebody thought I was having an affair with his wife. Yeah, but it's just so overwhelming. So many people know. Yeah. Now well, he said, it's not going to hold up. We know that. He said that Carolyn was aware of the accusation, but that she knew it wasn't true, and so she wasn't bothered by it. 
And that's far from the truth. Sure. Now, Kevin didn't ask about Carolyn or if there were any suspects. The murder of Carolyn Matthews was not a typical murder, of course, because statistically, murders are more likely to happen to a victim and an offender in their 30s who know each other, they're involved in a dispute, drugs and alcohol, usually a couple of guys. And Carolyn's a woman in a respectable neighborhood. She's a middle-class wife and mother, and she's found murdered on a weeknight. Yeah, those are anomalies. But what really struck them was the time factor. Right. Kevin came home, picked up the boys. They were only gone for 20 minutes, and Carolyn was murdered in that very short window of time. So you have to think that he was involved. Well, sure. I mean, this crime seemed like someone had specifically planned to murder Carolyn. Right. So next to the cat's food dish on the kitchen floor was a piece of evidence that would prove vital to the investigation. It was the first of several bloodied boot prints found at the scene. And it was soon ruled out that the boots had come from Kevin or the boys. So we got a stranger's boot print, likely the perpetrator. So it was a large work boot. Someone must have come to rob the house but they must have come unarmed because they used knives from the kitchen. Well, they may have come to rob the house. They don't know. That's just... Yeah, this is early before we get deeper into But nothing's missing. Right. Now, Carolyn's brother, Peter, was notified of Carolyn's death by police. They knocked on his door late that night. The police told him that there was more information, and they gave him a number of a detective to call. When he called the detective, he was told that she was murdered. Now, he broke down in tears, of course. Then he realized that, oh, my God, now I have to tell the rest of my family, including my mother. And we know that um, their father, their mother's husband, of course, had just died. Right. He had lung cancer, so it probably was not a particularly lovely death. No. So she's in grieving right now, and now she's yeah. going to find out her only daughter her died. Her daughter's dead. So it was quarter to 12 by the time Yvonne's sons came to her house to tell her that her only daughter had been murdered. So she was, of course, devastated. I don't know how she coped with that at that point. Now, it didn't take long for police to find out about Michelle and Kevin's affair, and then also about Michelle's relationship with David Key. David has shown his murder contracts to several people. So he's pretty brilliant, isn't he? He'd been bragging about it. Yeah. Darren Burgess brought phone bills to the detectives to show the connection between Kevin and his ex-wife. And he also made reference to David Key and reports that David and Michelle were together the day of the murder. So we got a lot of stuff linking all these guys. And now the Crime Stoppers' phones were running hot with tips. On July 16th, a call came in that a man named Scott Rose had information related to Carolyn's murder. So the caller said that Scott and a man named Jamie knew a man named Dave who was hired as a hitman by the victim's husband and was paid $60,000 to kill her. So Dave had given Jamie about $8,000 to buy a car, and then this is what pointed police to David. Right. Now, Michelle and Kevin were obviously persons of interest. Yes. One, One as the husband of the deceased and the other as the person the husband was having the affair with. Right. So I'm thinking, let's look at them. Sure. Information had come in about them having sex in a park. But anyway, on the morning of July 19th, police followed Michelle as she and David Key took a test drive of a new car. They left a deposit on the car. Now, bank records later showed that Michelle withdrew 16000 from her account that day. Yeah. Now, police were there when Michelle paid cash for the car, and David Key drove it off the lot. Afterwards, Michelle met with Kevin Matthews at a restaurant. She was seen laughing and crying, and the two seemed to be in a serious conversation. Kevin kissed her several times, and at one point he wiped a tear from her eye. Two hours later, (laughs) Michelle's in the new car, parked with David Key. The window was fogged over, but police could see David lying across the back seat without a shirt on, and he was moving in what looked like a sexual motion. (laughs) Isn't that just gross? It's more than gross. So as police were working the investigation, Michelle took on another boyfriend. This is a guy named Jason Colenso, 
and he knew David Key from jail, and David introduced him to Michelle. Uh, Jason had no place to stay when he was released from jail on a driving offense, and Michelle welcomed him into her place. Well, sure. Yeah. Now, Fresh pol- meat. Now, police got warrants to listen into Kevin and Michelle's call, so this was helpful. And it became clear that the two were still involved. They continued to book hotel rooms and spend time together, so they're not even trying to be discreet. No. Now, detectives also spoke to Kevin's co-workers who told them about Michelle and David's visit to the shop on the day of the murder. Right. So Michelle was clearly sleeping with David Key, as well as Jason Colenso, and her true love, Kevin Matthews. The police stopped David for traffic offenses, brought him in for interrogation. His boots and wallet were confiscated. Now, in the wallet, police found the contracts to kill David Burgess and Carolyn Matthews. Yeah. And his boots matched the boot prints from the murder scene. And, just as an added Philip, they also tested positive for Carolyn Matthews' blood. Well, that's a big deal. Well, yeah. It means he was there. Right. So police have sufficient evidence to charge David with Carolyn's murder at that point. Now, there's no direct connection between David Key and Carolyn, but Michelle is the one that connects them. Right. Now, police overheard Kevin say to Michelle, you're going down for it. A lot of people know during one of their meetings. So to charge Michelle with murder, police really needed to make the connection between Michelle and these murder contracts. So they got a warrant and they searched Michelle's house. In the house search, police found Michelle's diary So they were able to compare that handwriting to the writing on the murder contract, and that was a match. David and Michelle were together on the day of the murder, and the contract from his wallet matched her handwriting. So they thought they had enough there, and they went ahead and arrested Michelle at her home. Yeah, now this arrest triggered a media frenzy. Oh my God, it did. And things got really weird. They did. So Kevin goes into court the day after Michelle was arrested. And he's wearing a wide-brim cricket hat with forever written across the back. Now, have you seen that picture? Yeah. How it's like fucking written, stupid is it's that? It's like written inside the hat, yeah. like backwards. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's just deranged. So he's defending the woman accused of killing his wife. Although, you know, it kind of reminds me of um, D, D. Castile in the IHOP murders. It does. Like maybe his brain is pickled. It could be. And it's more people that are just not in their right mind with drugs and alcohol. Not as an excuse, but definitely as something that's contributing to this strange behavior. Well, it sounds like from what we've seen and read that he was a really hardcore alcoholic. Well, yes. I mean, two bottles of scotch a day. Yeah. That's, That's big. Sure it is. So the media, of course, they believe he's in on this murder plot. And we know that police believe that, too. Well, yeah. Then in another strange move, Kevin issues a statement denying his involvement and Michelle's involvement. And he also wrote, You don't know what you've got till it's gone. That's a Joni Mitchell song, isn't it? Yeah. Well, is that Joni Mitchell? Yeah, it's Joni, isn't it? Anyway, it's in a song, but I wonder what he meant by that. Do you think he's talking about Carolyn or Michelle? I think he's talking about Michelle. I think he's talking about Michelle. Me too. Because he's figuring he's going to skate on this and get away with it. I don't know about that. And she's going down. Well, he knows he's going to be separated from her. That's for sure. Yeah, so... Now, he had an alibi for the time of her murder. Well, yeah, so they know he wasn't the one that physically did it. Right. So they looked, the investigators looked through all the phone records and they saw numerous calls and texts between Michelle and Kevin on the day of the murder. Lots and lots. Lots and lots. Kevin had arranged to pick up the boys right after Michelle left his office. Right after Carolyn was killed, he got that three-second phone call from a payphone. So Kevin was arrested at home and his poor sons had to witness that. Right. So detectives had a case against Kevin, David, and Michelle. Michelle and David said things in jail that incriminated them further. And on the night before his court date, David rolled and he pled guilty. So he agreed to testify against Michelle and Kevin. And when he talked to police, 
I think what happened is he began to realize he'd been played by Michelle, because I think he was under the impression that he was her man. Now he's yeah. seeing that Kevin is her man, and that he was used to do the murder. But, I mean, for whatever reason, at least he decided to testify. So then, it was August 2003, Kevin Matthews and Michelle Burgess were both convicted of first-degree murder. Yeah, they got sentenced to life with a 30-year non-parole period. So at least 30 years in prison. Yes. For both of them. Now, the killer, to my mind, got off a little easier. Well, he took a plea. Right. Right. But he he's the one that did the actual act. Well, Michelle participated, though. She punched her, and I, I think she might have done more. She got the knives out of the drawer. Yeah. He was higher than a kite, so she was definitely in on it. He wasn't the only one to murder Carolyn. If he hadn't been there, I don't think Michelle would have had any problem doing it herself. Yeah, maybe. I'm not totally sure. I, really? I mean, I, know, I guess that's probably true. I, I think that she had him there for him to do it, so she didn't have to do it. Right. But if he wasn't there, yeah, I guess she would have done it. Well, I mean, Carolyn might have been able to fight her off if yeah, she, she met might him have been. with her. So, anyway, this was completely about selfishness and greed. David got 20 years, and the other two got at least 30, which I don't think they're going to get out in 30 years. I think they're done. No, they're toast. Yeah. Anything else on this case? Well, no, I don't think so. I'm just totally turned off. <laughs> I mean, this, this is just such a horrible thing, and, and it just seems like it could have been prevented. Well, sure. I mean, what can we learn from this? What makes it a worthwhile discussion? Uh, I mean, don't drink to excess. Well, yes, that's true. But I also would think, you know, take people for who they are. Like, there's a saying that if someone someone keeps showing you who they are, believe them. And I think that was Carolyn and Darren's problem is that Kevin and Michelle kept showing them that they were awful people, but they weren't accepting it. Yeah, exactly. So. I mean, Michelle in particular. Yes. I mean, a regular person, I, I didn't want to say sane person, but somebody with common sense, Darren would have said, should have said, would have said, I don't know, I'm not going to marry you. I mean, there's so much stuff pre-marriage that was going on that I'd be oh, yeah. walking I know, but she was quite a manipulator. Yeah, but she still. She manipulated him. I mean, he's so stupid that he felt I think you're that. too harsh on him. Yeah, I am. You're harsh on him. So who thinks they'd be a good detective? Let's find out. Hunt a Killer is the first ever interactive investigation that delivers clues and correspondence from a serial killer to you every month. Apply for membership at www.huntakiller.com. Your first episode ships the same day you join, so you get that instant gratification. To help support True Crime Brewery, Hunt a Killer is offering our listeners 10% off when you go to www.huntakiller.com and use the code BREWERY. And there's nothing better than solving your first case. So let's talk for just a minute about what's happening at Team Tie Grabber. We've got a vote taking place on our True Crime Brewery fan discussions page on Facebook for what our next members-only episode should be. The most recommended case for our new members-only episode is still the case of Tina Watson. Now she's a young woman who was killed on her honeymoon in Australia while scuba diving. Her husband was suspected and went to trial for murdering her, so it's a pretty complex case with lots of room for discussion. Now, if you haven't joined Team Tie Grabber, it's easy peasy. You just go to tiegrabber.com and sign up with PayPal. If you don't want to offer support that way, you can also support us on Patreon, and you can listen to members-only episodes there as a patron. There's also an absolutely free way for you to give us some support. The next time you shop Amazon, just go in through our website, and there's a link. It says Shop Amazon and Support Tie Grabber. That'll take you right to Amazon, and anything you buy will give us a tiny kickback from your purchase. Now, these are things you would have bought anyway, and we won't know what you bought, and there won't be any differences in the prices. It's just a great, easy way to give some support. If you have feedback for us, you can contact us at truecrimebrewery at tiegrabber.com. 
on Twitter at Tiger River Pods, on Instagram at Tiger River Podcasts, or on Facebook. As always, we really appreciate feedback from all of our listeners. We get some great feedback, and even if I don't answer it during one of our shows, I do read it all. Today's episode has been very long, so we're going to put off feedback until next week. Yeah, I, I think we spent a, a huge amount of time doing this case, and uh, we just felt like it was time to wrap it up for tonight, and we'll do feedback another time. Sounds good. So until next time, we'll see you at the quiet end. Bye-bye. Bye.